Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku became Captain America part 3rd. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 4 comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist. The author of this story Ultimate 10 from Out 3. So let's start the video. Midoriya gently chopped Yuraka on the head. Oh, she reached up to grab the top of her head, pouting. That didn't hurt. Midoriya rolled his eyes, and then looked back to the greenette. Anyways, what she means to say is it's nice to meet you, Miss Takage. Yeyarazu stepped forward. The greenette, Takage, finally noticed Yeyarazu and walked over to her with a roguish grin. Hey, motorcycle girl, good to see you. The others looked between the two girls in bewilderment. You know her, Yamomo? Yeah, Yuraka asked. Yeyarazu smiled and nodded. Yes, she was at the recommendation exam with me. Motorcycle girl. Tsunotori blinked in confusion. It's a long story. I can explain everything another time. Yeyarazu sheepishly responded. Oh, Midoriya turned to his fellow green-haired classmate. Does that mean you're a recommendation student like Yamomo? Yamomo? Huh. Takage looked at Yeyarazu slyly. Is that your nickname? Why yes, my friends call me that. Yeyarazu bashfully said with a tiny blush. You can too, if you want. Sure thing, Yamomo. Takage grinned, showing off her predator-like teeth. Yeyarazu felt elated. Months prior, she didn't have any real friendships, especially with people in her age group. Now, she had Yuraka and Midoriya as her best friends and two more potential friends in Tsunotori and Takage. And it was only the first day of UA. And to answer your question, Takage turned to Midoriya. Her smile dropping a bit, I didn't pass the recommendation exam. Came up just a little short. She chuckled while rubbing the back of her head awkwardly. But the school liked me so much they gave me the chance to take the standard exam. I passed that one, of course. That's wonderful. Yeyarazu smiled. You certainly deserve to be here. Thanks. That means a lot. Anyways, Takage regained her proactive aura and looked at Midoriya, Yuraka, and Tsunotori. Let me introduce myself. I'm Takage Zitsuna. Nice to meet ya. She held out her hand. Midoriya Izuku. Hi. I'm Yuraka Achako. Tsunotori Pony. Good to meet you, Takage-san. Pleasure's mine. Takage quickly and eagerly shook their hands. We're gonna get along just swell. Midoriya glanced around the room. Something had been baffling him since stepping inside. By the way, any clue where the other seats are? Other seats? Takage blinked. Yeah, there are 40 slots in the hero course, right? Aren't we all supposed to be in the same class? He elaborated. No, Yeyarazu shook her head and explained, UA splits their hero course into two classes, A and B, at every level. Ah, so that's why the A is on the door and on our hero-related classes. Midoriya was still curious. Why though? That's kind of strange. I mean, compared to other colleges, 40 people in a class isn't that big. The super soldier commented. Heck, he had over 60 people in several of his classes at the community college. Who knows? Takage shrugged nonchalantly. UA is known for being unconventional and all. At that statement, Midoriya felt inwardly relieved that he packed his bag with everything school-related this morning. He had a feeling that today would not be a conventional, ordinary first day. With no assigned seating, Midoriya, Yuraka, and Tsunotori had taken their place in the back corner together on the window side. Yeyarazu was at the corner with Midoriya sitting in front of her, and Yuraka sat in the desk next to him while Tsunotori had positioned herself next to Yeyarazu, essentially, the four back desks in the window side corner. Takage kept her belongings at the front desk but stayed in the back to chat. Over the next ten minutes, more students began to fill in and some began socializing. He would every so often look around at his fellow classmates. He recognized one of them, a dude with the head of a crow. He didn't appear to be much of a talker though as he found his seat in the middle of the room and leaned back, closing his eyes. Definitely a quiet type. Two girls walked in, appearing to have a casual conversation. One was a short, attractive girl with long dark green hair tied into a ponytail and seemed to have the disposition of a frog. The other was a plain yet cute-looking girl with short purple hair tied into a bob and had long earlobes. Were those auxiliary jacks? Midoriya wondered. The most animated student so far was a girl with pink hair, pink skin, small yellow horns, golden eyes with pitch black sclere, and with a bright disposition. Walking in beside her was a muscular dude standing at 175 centimeters with relaxed red eyes and spiky red hair. A friendly, confident expression was plastered on his face. Midoriya wasn't sure if those two were a couple or not. But they certainly looked the part, especially with how the red-haired guy's eyes subtly brightened when he glanced at the pink girl. Then again, he'd be the first to admit that he wasn't exactly an expert on romantic relationships. The next student Midoriya noticed walking in was a peculiar one in the super soldier's eyes. 
He was a moderately tall guy standing at 180 centimeters with a muscular build. He had shoulder-length hair split between white on his right side and crimson red on his left, tied up into a bun at the back. His eyes were also different as the right one was brown while the left was turquoise, both filled with indifference. Additionally, there was a large burn scar on the left side of his face that reached from his hairline to halfway down his cheek. He didn't greet anyone, immediately taking a seat in the back corner of the class. Serious aura around that guy. Midori amused. Even though he looks calm, he seems so. Angry, Midoriya didn't have more time to ponder on the dual-toned dude for long as a familiar spiky-haired blonde walked into the room with a perpetual scowl etched on his face. Back you go, huh? Back Hugo's eyes settled on Midoriya, narrowing. Green hair, you actually passed. Uh, yeah. Midoriya ignored the fact that he seemed surprised by that. Hug, Yuraka groaned. Not this guy again. Who is he, Yuraka chan Ye Yurazu asked. She deeply sighed. Just some jerk, trying to be cordial. Midoriya tried to at least start a good conversation with the ash blonde. I saw you did well on the exams. Congrats. By the way, I'm my Bekugo interrupted him. Of course I did. Those tests were a joke. He stated confidently, one hand in his pocket while the other held his school bag strap. Getting in here was too easy. He found an open desk on Midoriya's side of the room, choosing the second seat from the front and sitting his bag by it. Only one desk separated them. Bakugo sneered. Might have been a little rough for you extras I bet. Extras? Takage asked, earning the blonde's attention. That's right. Bakugo suddenly stood up on his desk. Listen up. All of you. Everyone in the class stopped to direct their attention to him. You're gazing upon greatness. I'm going to be number one around here. The top hero, like all might. He smirked darkly. I'm not overconfident or anything. I'm just that good. So, if none of you want to die or anything, you'll stay out of my way. Understand. Everyone was silent. Die, Midoriya blinked, trying to process this guy's sudden declaration. Um, what? Sunotori slipped into English, tilting her head. She, like everyone else, was dumbfounded by this scene. Did I stutter? Horns? He sneered. I said, he spoke in English, eligible, but accented, I'm going to be the number one hero, like all might. And all of you are red shirts. Extras. Stepping stones. Midoriya frowned as his right eye twitched. He thought at first maybe Bekugo was just joking around. One look into those sharp red eyes revealed that he had meant every single word both in Japanese and English. Great. He's one of those kinds of people. Wonderful. Midoriya dryly thought. Well, you speak English too. The spiky red-haired guy asked. What? Think I wouldn't. He glared at the redhead as if he were insulted. And then stepped down from his desk. PFFT. Without warning, Takage burst into laughter. Are you serious? Ha ha ha. Did you rehearse that before class? You trying to be an edgelord or something? Ha ha ha. Most of the class laughed at Takage's remark. Even Yeyarazu couldn't suppress an amused grin. What the hell did you say? Bakugo yelled, with sparks popping off his hands. You wanna go, green BTCH? Takage was unfazed and smirked, showing off her predatory teeth. Bring it on. I'll take you on anytime, any place, Sparky. Midoriya focused intently on the angry blonde's hands, involuntarily feeling his muscles tense up at the sounds. Hem. There were definitely many explosions coming off his palms. Is that his quirk? Making explosions? I like your confidence, dude. Redhead guy casually approached Bakugo with a charismatic smile. That's not confidence, it's just arrogance. Midoriya inwardly deadpanned. Still, you don't have to call out or insult everyone else like that. He lightly admonished. Are you just nervous or something? First day jitters. Shut it, shtty hair. Back Hugo snapped. I wasn't talking to you. But, your hair isn't that different from mine. The redhead pointed out, sweat dropping. He quickly regained his friendly smile and held out a hand to Back Hugo. Name's Kirishima Ijiru, by the way. What's yours? Back Hugo was briefly taken aback before slapping the hand away. I didn't ask for your name. Oh, I get it. Kirishima adopted a determined, confident look. You're the type of person where someone has to prove their strength for you to acknowledge them, right? Well, challenge accepted. No, dude. He's just an A. Midoriya remarked internally. Bakugo cocked a brow, his anger diminishing slightly. You're a slow one, aren't you? Well, I may not be the fastest guy around, but my hardening quirk more than makes up for it. Kirishima proudly stated, unaware of the insult thrown at him. Bakugo didn't immediately respond. Tsk. He clicked his tongue and sat at his desk, feet propped up. Whatever. Doesn't matter what shtty quirk you have. You'll never measure up to me. Kirishima clenched his fist, smirking confidently. We'll see about that. Won't we? Guess Kirishima is the type that can't help but be friendly with everyone. Midoriya thought. Still, you're barking up the wrong tree there. Kirishima-kun. Might wanna just forget about that one. The pink girl called out, echoing Midoriya's sentiments. Uh, it's you, said a familiar voice. Midoriya turned to see glasses at the door, standing tall and in his uniform. 
Huh, where have I seen that guy before? Iraraka said thoughtfully. Oh, hey, it's you. The guy with the engine quirk. What's up? Midoriya sat up from his desk to greet the bespeckled teen. The navy-haired teen perked up before adjusting his spectacles and walking toward Midoriya across the room before bowing deeply. Iraraka, Yeyurazu, Sunotori, and Takage standing nearby shifted their attention to glasses. Oh, hey, isn't that the guy who made everyone laugh at the exam orientation? Said a blonde guy with a black lightning bolt streak in his hair. Yeah, I think it is. The purple-haired earlobe girl replied. Not gonna lie, I kinda appreciate what he did. Pink girl remarked. He really calmed my nerves. Hero. The green-haired frog-like girl croaked like a frog. Same here. I felt a little better going to take my practical. Meanwhile, as they continued quietly conversing, glasses started talking to Midoriya. I apologize to you for my conduct during the practical exam. I clearly misjudged you back then. When you interrupted the exam orientation, I thought you were dishonoring everyone taking the test. He looked away shamefully. But you clearly saw the deeper meaning during the exam, didn't you? I saw how you saved this girl here. He motioned to Tsunotori, who looked at the bespeckled boy in confusion. And then you stopped the zero-pointer from potentially hurting other examinees at the sacrifice of your own score. Truly the test of what makes a hero. He bit his lower lip. I did not realize that till after the exam. If they had told us about the rescue point system, it would have made the act of saving others feel disingenuous and fraudulent. A clever way to evaluate those with heroic spirits, one in which I did not demonstrate. As much as it pains me to admit, you are a more superior and an exemplary student than me. Yue is more than honored to have you. Please receive my humblest of apologies. Midoriya was silent, blinking. This guy said all that without stopping to breathe. Nice set of lungs, I guess. Must be related to his quirk. His friends and a few other classmates paused to watch the interaction, making it feel even more awkward. Some had overheard Glass's mention of Midoriya defeating the Zero Pointer and looked at the Verdette in surprise. Whoa, that guy really took down the Zero Pointer? A plain black-haired dude asked. That's impressive. A multi-armed dude flatly commented. Hem. The crowhead boy nodded. Wonder how he managed that? Earlobe's girl asked. He'd have to be crazy strong to take that gimmick out. A robust man with big lips remarked. Bakugo discreetly looked back at Midoriya with narrowed eyes. As his classmates talked in the background, Midoriya rubbed his neck in embarrassment. I. T. Thanks. Apology accepted. I. Also apologize for my conduct during orientation. It was never my intent to disrupt it or distract anyone from the test. Just a misunderstanding on my part. He stopped to offer his hand. Let's start over. My name is Midoriya Izuku. Glass's blue eyes softened as he returned the super soldier's firm shake. I am Ida Tenya. It is a pleasure to meet you and have you as a fellow peer at UA Academy, Midoriya-san. Shut up and get a room already. I'm trying to relax before the teacher gets here. Bakugo growled, looking lazily at Ida and Midoriya. Noticing Bakugo's feet on the desk, Ida puffed his chest out in righteous indignation. Take those feet off your desk right now, Ida demanded. Huh? Bakugo only smirked. You're disrespecting university property, you cretin. Bakugo scoffed, seemingly enjoying the banter, like I care about the opinion of an extra. Where are you from? Sumi private high. Why does that matter? Bakugo smirked, sneering up at Ida. Sumi, huh? You must think you're better than me. He grinned roguishly. I'm gonna enjoy blowing it to bits, elitist. Ida went slack-jawed. Be blowing me to bits. You would threaten your own classmate. Are you sure you're in the right place? Bakugo's sneer remained as Midoriya placed a hand on Ida's shoulder. Ida san, let's not get riled up. Bakugo's eyes fell on the verdette. Let's just take our seats and get ready for not get riled up, huh? Bakugo cut Midoriya off. Why don't y'all mind your own business, Stealth Gaijin? Stealth Gaijin? Ida blinked, sounding confused. What? He didn't know. The ash blonde sneer intensified. This guy's a foreigner like horn girl back there. He jerked his thumb at Tsunotori, who flinched from being called out. His Japanese was so broken the first time I met him that it hurt my ears just listening to it. I've gotten better. Midoriya mumbled. Can still hear that dumb western accent. Bakugo remarked, Hey, I resent that. Sunotori angrily exclaimed, Only speak when you're spoken to, extra. Bakugo shouted back. Sunotori defiantly stuck out her tongue. Anyways, Bakugo looked back at the verdette. Bet you couldn't cut it at the American hero schools, so you thought you'd have better luck here, huh? A devilish grin spread on his face. I'm gonna enjoy crushing you. Major superiority complex. Maybe has an inferiority complex too. Midoriya pondered. Hiroraka had been listening to this exchange like everyone else and felt her ire rising. This Bakugo guy was just infuriating. Also, didn't Midori-kun risk his life to save this jerk from the sludge villain? How could he talk down to him like that? Hey, Hiroraka indignantly stood up. Don't talk to Midori-kun like that. He did way better on the exam than you. 
Midoriya snapped his head toward the brunette with wide, panicked eyes. Iraraka chan No, I don't want everyone to ya yeah, right. Bakugo scoffed. Doubt he even cracked the top 20. He looked at the verdette with a condescending smirk. Let's hear it, stealth gaijin. What was your placement? Uh, Midoriya bit his lip, slowly moving back. That's, well, he spoke in English. What was your placement? Uh, maybe someone else would like to share. He hoped to deflect the attention off of himself. Oh, we sharing our exam placements? Takage grinned wryly. Well, I got fourth. One away from the top three. But what can you do? She nonchalantly shrugged. I got fifth place. Kirishima laughed. Then rubbed the back of his head. My parents were pretty proud I cracked the top five. So was I. Tank girl beamed, making Kirishima blush. I got thirteenth myself. I say I did pretty well. She then turned to Yuraka, Tsunotori, and Yegarazu. What about you three? I got twelfth. Tsunotori shyly said. Not bad, horn buddy. Pink girl complimented, making the pony girl look away shyly. The energetic girl turned to Yeyarazu. And you, yeyarazu san Well, Yeyarazu became slightly timid. I got in on recommendations. Ooh, that's so cool, yeyarazu san She then turned to Yuraka. What about you, yeyarazu san Yuraka directed her attention to Bakugo, grinning proudly. I got second. Most of the class turned to look at the brunette girl in shock. She was one of the top three winners. That revelation caught Takage's attention as she looked at the brunette, an analytical glint in her green eyes. Bakugo clenched his teeth, clicking his tongue in annoyed ire. Round face got second. Had to be those damn rescue points. What a F king joke. I'll crush her and show everyone who's the best. Bet that hurt his pride. Yuraka was feeling satisfied. My, my, that's impressive. Truly, Yue is honored to have you in its halls. Ada declared with strange hand gestures. Yuraka couldn't help but sheepishly chuckle at Ada's weird actions. The blue-haired youth then turned to Midoriya who was a lot further away than he remembered. What about you, Midoriya-san? Where did you place? Uh, Midoriya swallowed some spit in his throat. Looks like his diversion didn't take the focus off of himself for too long. He glanced back at Yuraka, seeing her looking at him expectantly, a proud smile on her face. Now for the closing move. Finish him off, Midori-kun. Yuraka internally cheered. Yuraka chan dot 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 why? He inwardly sighed. Guess there's no getting out of it now, huh? I got. He muttered inaudibly. I didn't hear you. What did you say? Ida asked. Surely Midoriya had a high score. In the top ten perhaps. Midoriya took a deep breath. I got first. First, with that one word, a metaphorical bomb had been dropped in the classroom. Sunotori and Ida's eyes both widened in astonishment. Everyone's attention immediately shifted to the Verdette super soldier. Some were curious, like the sparkling blonde guy in the front. Others were analyzing, like the piercing gaze of the crow-head boy. The red-white-haired young man in the back turned to Midoriya, narrowing his eyes. Others were astonished like the blonde dude talking to the earlobe girl. And Takage whose jaw dropped a little to show off her sharp teeth. Yeyarazu and Yuraka were the only ones not surprised, the latter directing a victorious smirk at Bakugo. Speaking of Bakugo, the smoldering aura from him was palpable, and it didn't go unnoticed by Midoriya. His crimson eyes were burning holes in Midoriya's head. His teeth bared as he let out a soft, audible growl. His grip on his desk was so hard that it might start cracking along with the mini explosions crackling in his hands. No F King Wei. He inwardly raged. This guy beat me. Of all people, memories of the sludge villain incident flashed through his mind, which only made him angrier. That was the absolute worst day of his otherwise awesome life. Yuraka really enjoyed seeing the angry blonde's reaction. Serves you right, jerk. Yeyarazu looked at her verdette friend in empathy. He clearly wasn't enjoying being in the limelight. However, that was the price for being number one. Looking around, the reaction might have been missed, but she heard the collective thought. Midoriya Izuku, out of everyone trying to get into UA University, out of everyone in the class, in the hero course, got first in the practical exam. He, out of every freshman, was the closest to being a pro hero and everyone knew it. Midoriya, meanwhile, lowered his head and tried to ignore the stairs. Not how I was expecting my first day to start off. Already got a bullseye on my back. He inwardly groaned. It was never his intention to say anything related to his practical exam score. He was just answering a question in a conversation. He wasn't one to brag or anything. Well, it wasn't the first time having the spotlight shined on him. Memories of the tour flashed through his mind. Yeah, this really shouldn't be a big deal compared to all of that. He could walk this off, right? If you're here to talk about points, then pack up your stuff and leave. Dead silence filled the room. Everyone turned to the source of the voice. It was a scruffy, black-haired, baggy-eyed man inside a yellow sleeping bag lying on the floor. This guy was definitely missing out on sleep, Midoriya deduced. Who was he? Another student. Taking a headcount, he quickly dismissed that thought. There were already 20 people present. That meant, oh boy. The tired man stared at the class before scrambling for something in his bag. 
Welcome to UA University's hero department, he muttered tiredly. He brought his hand out, holding a juice box. One suck drained the entire container, slurping loudly in the process. Everyone in the class blanched at the sheer randomness of what they were seeing. Some babbled about the yellow caterpillar while others just stared. Who is this hobo? The class steadily went silent, waiting for the man to speak. It took you eight seconds to quiet down. Rolling into the room, he crawled out of the yellow bag, revealing himself to be a haggard man with long, unkempt hair and looked like he hadn't shaved in at least two days. He wore black, practical clothes and what looked like an incredibly long grey scarf around his neck and shoulders. Not good enough. Time is precious. Do me a favor and be rational. I'd greatly appreciate that. As this guy seriously our Midoriya didn't complete his thought as the man continued speaking. Anyways, I'm Aizawa Shota, your foundational heroics instructor. For the class portion, at least. Nice to meet you, I guess. He sounded bored and utterly devoid of emotion. Midoriya had joined the rest of the classroom in surprise at this point. He was their instructor. Granted, the super soldier had dealt with his fair share of quirky people in his time of service. But this guy looked like he was about to fall over from exhaustion at any moment. Certainly not someone teaching a class at a prestigious hero academy. Aizawa's eyes fell on Midoriya. You're not in a seat. In fact, he glanced around. Most of you aren't. They didn't need to be told twice. Midoriya quickly found his desk along with the others. For some reason, he got the feeling that someone was staring at him. Maybe he was just imagining things. Of course, his instincts had often not failed him before. Aizawa reached into his sleeping bag to pull out a blue uniform with white trim. Right, I want all of you to head to the locker rooms, get changed into your gym uniforms, and meet me at the training grounds. We have work to do. Everyone was confused. What about the entrance ceremony? It was going to start within 15 minutes. Why are you all just sitting around looking clueless? Aizawa demanded, sounding irritated. Get to it. Yes sir, replied most of the class. Welp, guess we're hitting the ground running. It looked like the Verdette's intuition was proven correct, feeling a sense of deja vu right now. After changing in the locker rooms, the 101 students made their way to what appeared to be a fairly regular PE field. The only difference was that the field at the center of the track had several different machines in place. Where the hero department uniforms were somewhat subdued, the gym uniforms were loud and bright. They were blue with red and white highlights, the white parts spilling out UA across their bodies. Aizawa waited for them with a scowl. It took all of you 10 minutes to get here, even with those basic gym uniforms. A pro hero can get into the most complicated costume and respond to a crisis in five. Not a good start. He jerked his thumb over his shoulder at the field. Follow me. We'll be taking a quirk apprehension test today. Quirk apprehension test. Most of the class shouted. Aizawa was irritated but maintained his composure. Um, excuse me, Aizawa-sensei. Iroraka hesitantly held up her hand. What about the entrance ceremony? Aizawa shrugged uncaringly. If any of you want to leave to attend it, go ahead. I technically can't stop you. You're all adults, young, but adults nonetheless. Just know you'll be kicked out of the hero course if you do decide to leave. Some of the students gaped in surprise. That's right. I have the authority to do that. At UA, we're not bound by convention. Aizawa explained. We have a more freestyle approach to education. That applies to instructors as well. So I can run my class however I see fit. Midoriya stood up straighter in line and kept his expression neutral, remaining silent. He felt like he was back in the SSR training camp right now with the no-nonsense vibe Aizawa was giving off. After a short walk, the class was now standing near a drawn circle in the training field. All right. The disheveled man turned towards the group. Ball throw. Standing long jump. 50 meter dash. Distance run. Grip strength. Side to side stepping. Sit ups. Seated toe touch. You did all of these in high school during your standard non-quirk gym tests. Aizawa took a deep breath. Japan still insists on prohibiting quirks when calculating the averages of those records so as to give those with less power more of a chance. It's not rational. The Department of Education is just procrastinating and wasting time for those who should be ahead of the pack. He pointed at Bakugo. You, what was your record for the softball throw in high school? 75 meters, give or take. Bakugo said resolutely. Right. Aizawa reached into a bucket beside him and tossed him a UA quirk test softball. Go stand in the circle over there. Use your quirk to send the ball as far as you can. As long as you don't leave the circle, I don't care what you do. He stepped back, grabbing the work phone that would track all the results of the test. Back Hugo grinned. Awesome. He stomped over to the circle that surrounded a solid mound of dirt. He stretched his limbs, walking into the circle. All right then, here goes. He drew his arm back and then hurled the ball skyward. Just before it left his hand, he unleashed a massive explosion. Die. Everyone was bemused by that exclamation. 
Everyone watched as the ball rocketed out of sight, most of them beginning to murmur amongst themselves. Midoriya's gaze fell to Bakugo's hands. He couldn't help but feel impressed, so he can create explosions. I wonder how he does it. Is it just from his hands, or can he fire them from other appendages too? How much backlash can his body handle? Is his body fireproof? Midoriya's mind was racing a mile a minute, fascinated by the blonde's quirk. The ball finally landed and Aizawa looked down at the result. Knowing the limits of your abilities is crucial. He showed them the phone, displaying 750. Two meters. That's the first step to figuring out what kind of heroes you'll be. Ah, uh, makes sense. Midoriya thought. Find out our maxes so we know where to improve on going forward into the semester. The rest of the class was getting excited. Man, did you see that explosion? That was so awesome, Kirishima exclaimed. Bakugo only smirked as he walked out of the circle. Midoriya watched Bakugo carefully. On the one hand, the ash blonde's potential was practically oozing off of him like water from a wet sponge. On the other hand, he was an abrasive egomaniac who loved to preen like a peacock when given praise. Lovely, Midoriya internally groaned. He'll be fun to be around. I wanna go, this looks fun. Pink girl clapped her hands together. This is what I'm talking about. Getting to use our quirks as much as we want. A black-haired dude cheered. The comments continued like that for a while until Aizawa gave them a terrifying glare. Midoriya wasn't sure what the man's quirk was, but it had something to do with the way his eyes glowed red and his hair rose up. Fun. You think this is all about fun? The man seemed to ooze killing intent, to the point that most of the class was immediately terrified. A few students were able to meet his gaze. Akugo had already been exposed to near death, thanks to the run-in with that sludge villain ten months ago. The dual-haired young man also remained stoic as if he had gone through worse in his life. Midoriya was the least deterred of the group as he had already been through many deadly battles before. Here at UA, you've got four years to become the best heroes you can be. You think it'll be all fun and games? He demanded. The question made the class shut up, and Aizawa shot them a creepy grin that promised untold pain. Idiots. We will be taking eight physical tests. The one with the lowest score across all eight events will be judged hopeless and will be expelled on the spot. No questions asked. Well at, most of the class's air was deflated. Midoriya blinked twice as he too was taken aback by the declaration. That seems way too extreme. Heck, even a normal boot camp back home wouldn't do something so drastic on the first day. His thoughts shifted to his first day at the SSR. This situation felt kind of similar, strangely enough. Aizawa shifted his attention to Midoriya. I have an additional challenge for you. He pointed to the verdette, making him perk up from being suddenly singled out. Midoriya, right. Why yes sir, additional challenge. Why? You earned first place on the practical exam but earned the least amount of villain points in the top three. Also, you used that support item to take down most of your targets. Is that right? Yes sir. He was confused. Where was he going with this? I'll cut to the chase then. Aizawa's gaze narrowed. If you fail to impress me with your own ability in these tests, I'll expel you on the spot, regardless of where you rank at the end. Aizawa stated flatly. Understood. Midoriya's neutral expression slightly faltered. He never expected to be called out in such a way, on the first day, no less. He looked closely at Aizawa's face for any sign of deceit and came to a quick conclusion, he was dead serious. He recomposed himself and nodded. Yes sir. Sunatori glanced over at her fellow foreign exchange student worriedly. She didn't understand why Midoriya was being singled out in such a manner. Hadn't he already proved that he deserved to be here in the entrance exam? Yeirazu's eyes slightly widened in surprise. So far, she had been the least affected by Aizawa's challenge to the class. In her mind, she could see it for what it truly was. But this, it was as if an unknown variable had been suddenly introduced and screwed up all the equations and calculations she was seemingly performing in her brilliant brain. But why? What's the purpose in giving Midori-kun such a test when he's already aced the practical exam? Yeirazu pondered. I don't understand. Hiroraka, meanwhile, was at a loss for words. Why you can't do that? It's only the first day. I mean, I even. That isn't fair. Fair, you say. Our natural disasters fair. Aizawa immediately retorted. How about villain attacks? Highway accidents? The world is full of unfair things. It's better you learn that now while you still have opportunities in life. If you really want to be heroes, you have to push through your comfort zones. His grin turned even more menacing. That's what it means to go beyond, to be plus ultra. Your fate is in your hands. Now show me what you can do. That phrase again. Why was the school using it? He'd look into it soon. But for now, the super soldier had more important matters to worry about. Midori adopted a serious look and steeled himself. So, not only do I have to do well in the tests, but I have to impress Mr. Aizawa too. Well then, time to show them what I'm made of. No holding back. Several minutes later, the class prepared for the first test, the 50-meter dash. Two students went at a time. And the matchups were selected at random on Aizawa's phone. For the first matchup, 
Ida Tenya vs. Midoriya Izuku Midoriya remembered how fast Ida ran during the practical. He wasn't a radar gun, but he estimated Ida had to have reached 90 kmh at some points. Ida could probably go faster in a straight line and with enough distance, but he only had 50 meters to run, so Midoriya was feeling confident he could overtake him. As the two approached the starting line, Midoriya was about to wish Ida good luck until he surprised him by beating him to the punch, so to speak. The bespeckled teen earnestly bowed, and then shook his hand before getting ready. He could appreciate the gesture, but Ida could stand to tone it down a little, he thought, getting down into a sprinter's position and placing his feet on the kickstands. Midoriya spotted Aizawa standing at the far end with robots to measure their speed. Right, robots are commonplace in some places these days. That's kinda cool. Wonder if Terminator is a thing anymore. No wait, focus. You can research old movie franchises later. He internally prepared himself. Runners on your marks. The robot shouted out. They got set. Ready. Then, the gun fired. Midoriya dashed forward as hard as he could, pushing himself to full speed as fast as possible. Aider rushed forward in a flashier burst of speed from his leg engine. As soon as the race began, it was already over as both young men crossed the finish line. Ada stopped to look at Midoriya, wide-eyed. Midoriya, 2, 78 seconds. The robot chimed. Ada, 2, 98 seconds. The class was impressed by their fast times, with the obvious exception of Bakugo, who clenched his jaw in annoyed frustration. Not bad. Aizawa was impressed with both students, looking at the times on his phone. Still, Midoriya needs to show me more than just speed. Alright, next matchup, Ashido vs. Ayama. Aizawa shouted. Mush, people. Well done, Midoriya-san. Ida earnestly congratulated him. I had no idea you possessed such speed. T thanks. He smiled as the duo walked back to the rest of the class. You were right on my tail at the end though, Ida-san. Guessing you couldn't reach your top speed. He asked as both young men walked back to their fellow students. Ada shook his head, pushing his glasses up. No, I'm afraid I was only able to reach third gear. I need more room to reach my top gear. Only his third gear? Huh. How many gears does he have then? Midoriya shortly pondered, and then realized something. I may have won this match, but Ida is definitely the faster one. As the test continued, Midoriya and Ida maintained the top two times. Yeirazu and Takage were matched up and the former created a pair of rollerblades to finish at 4. 90 seconds while the latter shockingly split her body into several pieces and flew toward the finish line in 4. 1 seconds. Some students gaped at Takage's quirk as she effortlessly put herself back together at the finish line, unfazed by having her body split apart. Midoriya was definitely going to seek Takage out later and ask about her quirk. What an amazing ability. Takage seemed quite satisfied with her time but didn't brag as she showed good sportsmanship by shaking Yeirazu's hand. Bakugo used his explosions to propel himself to a 4. 3 second finish but seemed frustrated with himself. Maybe because he wasn't in first, nor the top 3. Yuraka and Tsunotori were matched up against each other. The former used her quirk on herself and pushed herself off the kickstands while the latter used her horns to fly to the finish line. It was a photo finish as Yuraka's 5. 7 seconds edged out Tsunotori's 5. 10 seconds. Both girls congratulated each other and seemed pleased with their times. However, Midoriya noticed Yuraka looked a little extra chipper from her victory, as if she were pleased to come out on top against the foreign pony girl. A. Probably nothing. The second test. Grip strength. This test was straightforward. Grip as hard as you can on a dynamometer to measure out your highest reading. He looked around and saw his classmates gripping their devices. One student, the robust guy with big lips, Sato Rikido, was allowed to eat a cupcake for his quirk, granting him a sugar high that pushed his max to 700 kilograms. He also noticed some other students gathered around the silver-haired man with multiple appendages, Shoji Mizo, who was gripping nearly 570 kilograms. Not bad at all. Midoriya looked down at his hand-held dynamometer. Been a while since I've done a grip test. I recorded a little over 15 o pounds back at the SSR. Course, that was over 150 years ago. He glanced at his device determinately. No holding back. He gripped as hard as he could until he heard a loud beep. He looked down and was surprised. 999. 99 kilograms. Midoriya blinked in surprise, his mouth slightly agape. I know I got stronger doing all that training with all might. But this, it's over double my record. Is it broken? Ooh, Mr. Aizawa. He accidentally slipped into English and quickly corrected himself, speaking in Japanese. I I mean, Aizawa sensei. The tired man lazily looked over at Midoriya showing him the device's results. He then looked down at his phone. Sorry, I may have broken it. Is there a stronger dynamometer or you're fine? Just put it back. Aizawa instructed. Midoriya nodded and then placed the dynamometer back on a table. Whoa, the pink girl, Ashido Mina, exclaimed as she looked over at Midoriya's device while turning hers in. 
That's a lot of 9 seconds. Huh, someone beat my score. Sato walked over, recovered from his sugar-induced craze. Wow, that's cool. He was impressed. Hee <laughs> hee. Yeah, I guess it is. Midoriya laughed, bashfully rubbing his neck. Yuraraka overheard the conversation as she moved to return her device. What mark did you get, Midori-kun? She looked over and was stunned. Well, did you actually get 999 kilos? That, or maybe he broke the machine. Ashido mused. Kirishima finished his test and checked Midoriya's score out of curiosity. Break. Dude, you totally went beyond that. You did more than Sato or Shoji. He slapped Midoriya's back. Nice one. Thanks. Just doing my best. Midoriya replied. He did his best to avoid Bakugo's simmering glare, who was gripping his device over and over, futilely trying to match Midoriya's measurement. After everyone completed the test, Aizawa quickly went over the scores on the phone. Midoriya and Yeyurazu had both broken their dynamometers as their scores were unreadable. Yeyurazu had created a miniature hydraulic clamp that kept applying pressure until her machine broke, as expected of a recommendation student with versatility and intelligence. As from Midoriya, his speed, his strength, I suppose his enhancement quirk is nothing to scoff at. Still, out of curiosity, let's see how he does with the rest of the tests. The black-haired man mused. He altered the score, adding a note saying enough to Midoriya's and Yeyurazu's zeros. The third test, standing long jump, crouching low. Midoriya leapt forward as far as he could and managed to clear the 4-meter long sandpit by 5 meters. However, his impressive mark was blown out of the water by his friends and several classmates. Yuraraka, Takage, and Tsunotori used their respective quirks to fly across the sandbox. Yuraraka made herself weightless, Takage simply split herself up and flew across, and Tsunotori scaled the pit using her horns. Yeyurazu simply conjured a javelin to get air and cover the distance. Not much he could do to beat that, he thought. Additionally, it, Bakugo, the sparkling blonde-haired guy, Ayama, and the frog girl, Asui, used their quirks to easily scale the jump. The dual-haired dude, Todoroki, amazingly summoned ice to ride across the sandbox, shocking the verdette. He can summon ice and ride on it like Frazone from The Incredibles. Amazing. He inwardly gushed. Maybe he can find out more about his ability later. Aizawa looked over the distances on the phone. Very impressive crop this year, he thought. The fourth test, side to side stepping Midoriya did very well on this test. He'd made it a priority to never skip leg day. He was able to reach incredible speeds without the long wind-up that Ida required. The only two students able to match him near the end were Minta Minoru, a small dude with purple balls on his head, and Bakugo. Minda used the detachable balls on his head to rapidly bounce himself back and forth while Bakugo was just in good shape and very determined. Regardless, with enhanced stamina, Midoriya was able to outlast both classmates and would have kept going until Aizawa told him to stop so they could move on to the next test. The fifth test, ball throw. It was a simple, straightforward test. Stay in the circle and throw the ball, anything goes. Many of the students used their abilities in creative ways to throw the ball, some going far, others not so much. Thankfully, for Aizawa, the event was going by fast. Things got very interesting, however, when it was Yuraraka's turn. Rather than throw it, she gave Midoriya and Yeyurazu a nervous smile, pressed her fingers against the ball, and gently tossed it up. It never came back down. Aizawa tried to get a read on how far it went, but his sensor just flickered and spouted a series of numbers and letters. He frowned and slapped the phone a few times, the screen fizzled, and then settled on an infinity symbol. Infinity. The majority of the class yelled simultaneously. Midoriya and Yeyurazu were the only ones not shocked as they looked at their brunette friend with proud smiles. Though Midoriya did feel a little bad for Yuraraka because she looked incredibly embarrassed from the attention. Yeyurazu's turn was just as interesting as she had created a bazooka of some kind expertly placed it on her shoulder, and fired the ball out of it. The ball soared out of sight until Aizawa held up the phone to display three kilometers, earning several cries of surprise. Midoriya couldn't help but whistle in amazement. Hiroraka chan and Yamomo are incredible. Yeyurazu received an equal amount of praise from their classmates as she walked back. But Midoriya noticed she seemed fairly tired, likely due to her depleting a significant amount of her lipids and her creations over the tests. Bakugo could barely contain his seething rage from losing to round face of all people. Then Ponytail had to cheat and knock him down to third place. Third place, just like in the practical exam. He could feel his blood boiling as his nails dug into his palms. Whatever. It didn't count. Damn cheaters. He inwardly cursed. Then, it was finally Midoriya's turn. I'm definitely not beating your Raka chan or Yamomo's scores. The next highest one is Bakugo's. He thought while approaching the circle with a ball in hand. That'll be tough to beat. 
But see dot 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 my previous record was around 1,800 feet. Maybe that's gone up too. Standing in the circle, Midoriya looked down at the long expansive field in front of him. Closing his eyes, he took a deep breath. Memories of watching Zack throw pitches when he was younger played through his mind. Jacka or not, the guy knew how to throw a ball. So, I'll throw his signature fastball, only higher. The Verdette got into a wind-up stance, bewildering the class. They hadn't seen a stance like that before. Even Aizawa cocked an eyebrow in intrigue. Interesting stance. He mused. Is he using a technique to put extra power into his throw? Smart. Tsunotori lightly gasped as she recognized the stance, and her tail involuntarily swished from excitement. He knows about that old game too. Lifting his left leg up and smoothly placing it down. Midoriya followed through as he wound up his arm, corked his entire body, and threw the ball upward with as much torque as he could. A fastball pitch only released at a higher angle, similar to an outfielder's throw just with extra steps. With no flashy explosions or cannon fire, the ball quietly went sailing through the air. It flew further and further until they could barely see it. Aizawa turned around and displayed the result. 800. 5 meters. Midoriya's eyes widened. Whoa, I really have gotten stronger. Thank you, all might. He couldn't suppress an excited grin. All that training at the beach and constantly wearing those 200 kilogram resistance bands had really worked wonders. Nice, dude. Takage grinned. That's some serious raw power. Well, he got first in the practical, so it's not too surprising. Shoji added, creepily talking through a mouth on one of his arms. Ha, huh, and here I thought I was going to be the strongest. Sato mused. Yue really is full of surprises. Midoriya bashfully smiled at the praise as he walked back toward his friends. Great job, Midori-kun. Iraraka beamed. Yei Irazu nodded. Your augment quirk is truly something special. T thanks guys, but you both deserve more praise. You've been awesome so far. Midoriya excitedly replied, making both girls blush. Bakugo, meanwhile, was not a happy camper. Are you F King kidding me? He blinked, ensuring he wasn't seeing things. The number remained the same. 800 meters, a full 50 ahead of his own score. His jaw dropped and his eyes were as wide as plates. How could he have thrown that ball so far with just raw strength alone? It wasn't possible. He was like. The realization hit Bakugo like a lightning bolt, and he felt himself freeze up. He was like a mini All Might. The blonde struggled to breathe as it felt like his airway was restricted. He couldn't deny what he had just seen now and in the prior tests. The stealth Gaijin was stronger than him. His own raw strength had beat out his explosion quirk. His physical feat surpassed him. Was his first place in the practical exam not a fluke? Bakugo clenched his fist and ground his teeth. No, that couldn't be it. He was just dumb muscle. Fumbled in his speech when flustered, and had that stupid western accent of his when he talked. It was infuriating. He may look Japanese and speak the language better than he used to, but he refused to acknowledge him as a fellow Japanese. He simply wasn't. Just a stupid American sojourner that belonged back overseas. Besides, his dumb enhancement quirk, or whatever it was, had nothing on Bakugo's raw power and versatility. He could use his explosive blasts to fly, and fight in close quarters or long range. The stealth Gaijin was just a severely watered-down form of All Might. Nothing more, nothing less. Bakugo glanced over at the Verdette, who looked flustered while conversing with Round Face and Ponytail. That trio together had knocked his amazing score to fourth place. In his mind, it didn't count. All three of them were cheaters. Enjoy your time at the top while you can, stealth Gaijin. Bakugo's snarl shifted into a devilish grin. For the first time in his life, he had a true challenge. A worthy obstacle for him to overcome. Fine, bring it on. All Might, his idol, faced challenges with a smile. He would do the same. I will surpass you. I'm gonna relish knocking you off that F King Ivory Tower and send you packing back to America where you belong. Just you wait. Midoriya Izuku. The sixth test, sit-ups. Midoriya aced the test with ease. He beat out everyone including Ada, Sato, Shoji, and finally Bakugo. Bakugo hung in there for a while. But he finally collapsed after 110 reps. However, the super soldier kept going with no sign of slowing down. Iraraka, who had been the one holding his legs, looked on with a flustered expression. Midori-kun's strength and stamina was something else, she thought. Aizawa eventually told him to stop, saying he had seen enough. The seventh test, seated toe touch. Again, this test was no issue for him. He kept doing toe touches effortlessly and beat out everyone. He made it a priority to be as flexible as he could, and never skipped stretches. After 150 reps, Aizawa told him to stop again to move on to the final test. Midoriya could practically feel Bakugo glaring daggers at him. What was his problem? The eighth and final test, distance running. Yeyarazu summoned a moped and drove around the track, taking the lead. Midoriya and Ida managed to keep up with her at a fast pace, neither one slowing down. 
Although Ida technically was faster, the true test was endurance, and both were exhibiting that in spades. Bakugo was trailing not too far behind the trio as he used his explosions to propel himself forward. Tsunotori flew around the track on her horns and was keeping up with the leaders for a good portion of the race. However, exhaustion from overusing her quirk had taken over and forced her to complete the race on foot before she eventually ran out of steam. Takage was in a similar spot as Tsunotori as she had split her body into multiple parts and flew around the track until exhaustion finally crept up. Uraraka, however, couldn't use her quirk in this setting and was the first of their group to tap out from exhaustion. At the end, only Midoriya, Ida, Yeirazu and Bakugo remained on the track while everyone else was catching their breaths on the field. With the end of the class period approaching, Aizawa was forced to tell the quartet to stop. It's obvious all of you can keep going. Stop wasting my time, Aizawa had said. I'll display the final results shortly. Ida gave Midoriya an impressed nod and Bakugo merely sneered at him, which he ignored. The ash blonde was drenched in sweat and exhausted while Midoriya and Ida were holding up just fine. They could run extra laps if they wanted. Yeirazu dismounted her bike and smirked at Midoriya. Thanks for giving me the motorbike idea back then. She whispered, shooting him a wink. It really is a handy creation. Midoriya chuckled lightly, blushing slightly. Ha, hey, you're welcome. Glad it's working out for you. If you're all done standing around, the results are in. Mr. Aizawa called out. This was it. Whoever received last place in the test would be expelled. And if Midoriya hadn't impressed Mr. Aizawa, he would be too. Midoriya was feeling slightly anxious but maintained a calm composure. He was confident he did well enough. He didn't get first in every test, but he had gotten in the top three in the rest, not counting the standing long jump. Several people had beaten his jump by a wider margin in that particular test. Even so, that was still enough to impress Mr. Aizawa, right? I'm just going to bring up the whole list. It's not worth going over each individual score. Aizawa informed the class as he clicked the device in his hand. A hologram appeared and listed off their names from 1st to 20th place. 1. Midoriya Izuku 2 Yeirazu Momo 3 Todoroki Shoto 4 Bakugo Katsuki 5 Ida Tenya 6 Takage Sitsuna 7 Takoyami Fumikage 8 Shoji Mizo 9 Tsunotori Pony 10 Yuraka Achako 11 Kirishima Aijiro 12 Ashido Mina 13 Kota Koji 14 Sato Rikido 15 Basuitsuyu 16 Ayama Yuga 17 Zero Hanta 18 Kaminari Denki 19 Jairo Kaiyuka 20 Minta Minoru Midoriya couldn't help but smile at his and his friend's placements. He and Yeirazu got first and second. That's great. Meanwhile, Yuraka and Tsunotori both placed in the top ten as well. Not a bad way to start freshman year. His eyes went down the list to see who had unfortunately placed last. Ah, the short guy with purple balls for hair, Minta. Midoriya sympathetically glanced over at Minta. Poor guy. To get this far and to have it. Enooo. Minta screamed at the rankings. I can't be expelled. How will I get popular with girls and touch their bodies now? Midoriya blanched. Uh, never mind. Needless to say, that declaration was met with less than pleasant reactions from the girls of the class. Degenerate. Yeirazu huffed, looking away from the wailing boy. You're gross. Earlobe's girl, Gyro, glared at the panicking Minta. That's not very heroic. The frog-like girl, Asui, admonished. Pervert. Ashido scoffed. Takage rolled her eyes and turned away from Minta. Serves you right, shorty. That's just wrong. Tsunotori backed away from the short boy. That's why you're here. Yuraraka looked creeped out and unconsciously moved closer to Midori. Also, I lied about expelling the person in last place. Aizawa grinned like a troll. The class looked utterly stunned, save for Yeirazu. Wait, really? Midoriya slipped into English. Shaking his head, he switched back to Japanese. I mean, really. No one seemed to have noticed his faux pas. It was all a logical ruse, meant to bring out the best in all of you. He elaborated with a toothy grin. W-H-A-A-A-T. Ada, Yuraka, and Tsunotori shouted with various shades of pale and surprise. Ah, uh, I see now. Midoriya understood the situation. He threatened last place with expulsion to motivate everyone. Dirty move, but effective. To the side, Yeirazu sighed in disappointment at her classmates. Of course he wasn't serious about that. They wouldn't expel one of us that easily. Aizawa raised an eyebrow at Yeirazu's statement, as if he was tempted to expel someone just to prove her wrong. Midoriya nodded. If that threat hadn't been hanging over us, everyone wouldn't have given it their best. Yeirazu discreetly turned to Midoriya looking slightly worried, remembering Aizawa's direct challenge to him. Surely Mr. Aizawa wasn't serious with that challenge either. But the look on Aizawa's face, and the fact he had singled Midoriya out made Yeirazu wonder if their instructor was indeed serious about it. He scored first, so he should be in the clear, right? I'm saved. Minta cheered loudly. 
Without warning, he was wrapped up in Aizawa's scarves and dragged in front of the teacher. Aizawa's eyes glowed red with his quirk as he held Minda off the ground at eye level. That being said, if you don't improve your behavior you'll be out of here before you know it. He informed the, once again, panicking boy. Just because you're not going home today doesn't mean you aren't the first one on the chopping block. Do you understand? Minda nodded rapidly before being released from Aizawa's scarves and dropping to the ground. He then remembered something. The other challenge he issued. Oh, Midoriya. Aizawa called out. The super soldier perked up at his name, as Aizawa looked at him tiredly. Good work today. You're off the hook dot 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 for now. Midoriya blinked before he bowed. Oh dot 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 um, thank you, sir. Yeyarazu and Yuraka both sighed in relief while Tsunotori's tail happily swished from this news. Anyways, Aizawa sighed, turning to face the class, we're done here. Your syllabus and documents regarding the hero course are on your desks in the classroom. Give them a look when you can. Class dismissed. The class began to make their way towards the locker rooms to change out of their gym uniforms. Underhanded trick, but I can see where he's coming from. Midori amused. This semester should be interesting. Meanwhile, Aizawa was walking back towards the teacher's lounge with a certain green-haired student on his mind. He didn't know why, but something just seemed off about Midoriya, and he couldn't quite place it. His powers weren't the question mark, no. Speed, strength, and agility were traits many strong heroes acquired. The incredible endurance and stamina he displayed wouldn't raise much concern either if he was just a strong individual. However, it was the factors outside of the quirk apprehension test that had caught his attention. For one, he had noticed Midoriya seemed to carry himself like a soldier, always standing straight and normally keeping a calm, collected demeanor. Well, when he wasn't talking to the girls, he needed to work on that. Still, that wasn't too big of a deal in itself as Yue had had trained individuals come in as freshmen before. That support item of his, the shield, was another. Whatever metal it was made of was able to tear through the foe villains like nothing while still bouncing off objects like a pinball. Even Power Loader seemed befuddled about it. The only times he ever remembered seeing anything like it were in those old movies about the first hero he had seen when he was younger. That thought made Aizawa pause. The skill Midoriya displayed while utilizing that shield during the practical exam was remarkable. So remarkable that he had been initially concerned that Midoriya was relying too much on it to cover up potential physical downfall. But those concerns were clearly no longer valid. Where could he have gotten such an item and learned to use it so well? He'd have to check Midoriya's files this evening. Maybe he'd find some answers there. Aizawa, you liar. The black-haired man snapped out of his reverie, unsurprised by the number one hero's appearance. He had noticed the large man peeking out behind the corner during most of the tests. Something you need, all might. Aizawa droned, hands pocketed as he looked up at the blonde titan of a man. A logical ruse. Nice try, but April Fool's was last week. You expelled an entire class of freshmen last year. All might exclaimed accusingly. Yes, Aizawa casually replied. You toss aside those with zero prospects without batting an eye, and go back on your word. All Might cocked a brow. Also, you singled out young Midoriya from the start for seemingly no reason. Why? Aizawa looked at the blonde Goliath closely. I wanted to ensure he was more than that shield he was using for the exam. He proved me wrong. He shrugged nonchalantly. Simple as that. In fact, his abilities. He narrowed his gaze. Are similar to yours, All Might. Huh. All Might flinched slightly. You think so? I know he said that Serum made him stronger, but enough for Aizawa to make that comparison. All Might mused. I suppose my aim to pass plan was very effective then. He couldn't help but feel a little proud of himself for that. What's your connection with him? Aizawa asked, getting straight to the point. What do you mean? He's my student. He tried to play off, but the underground hero wasn't buying it. Fine. He walked past the hulking blonde. Don't tell me. I'll get answers one way or another. Clearly there's a connection between those two. I'll find out what it is. Aizawa thought as he stalked off. The field class is tomorrow. I'll review the footage after and see how Midoriya performs. Why do I have a feeling that more sleepless nights are coming? Well, he'd worry about that later. For now, his sleeping bag was calling to him. He would not keep her waiting any longer. All Might, meanwhile, watched as Aizawa sauntered off. Hmm, he tapped his chin. Hopefully Aizawa doesn't get too suspicious of young Midoriya. Perhaps I should warn him. But if I do, he may hold back in the field class tomorrow, which may garner even more suspicion and possible disciplinary action from Aizawa. The blonde giant groaned and slumped in anxiety. Yeah, they may have a problem here. Why did young Midoriya's foundational heroics instructor have to be Aizawa of all people? The rest of the day had thankfully been uneventful. The instructors for Hero Class A's remaining classes, who were all active pro-heroes, handed out syllabuses and explained how their respective classes would be taught before dismissing them early. Even the field portion of the heroics class that afternoon consisted of just picking up a syllabus with a teacher's note stating to come ready for tomorrow. 
Midori assumed that All Might was too caught up in something else to attend the class, used up his three-hour time limit for the day, or both. As a result the students had plenty of time to greet and converse with one another. After being dismissed from their last class, Klasa walked down the halls to begin their trek home. Midoriya was currently walking alongside Yuraka and Yeyarazu with a few others close by. So, Midoriya, what is your quirk exactly? Pink girl grinned at him. The name's Ashido Mina, by the way. Yes, Ida pushed his glasses further up on his nose. I was also going to ask that question. The strength, speed, and endurance you displayed in the tests today were truly exceptional. You could just say it was really cool, Ida-san. A fairly normal black-haired boy standing at 180 centimeters with large, canister-shaped elbows and an easygoing smile rested his hand on Midoriya's broad shoulder. Oh, I'm Siro Hanta. Pleased to meet you guys. Midoriya smiled. Both Siro and Ashido had friendly auras around them that made it very hard to dislike them. He started the quirk explanation he had committed to memory. Well, my quirk, Augment, isn't anything too special. It just enhances every facet of my body, both physical and mental. I see. Ida held his chin in a contemplative manner. That would mean your quirk doesn't just enhance your physical strength then, but your mind as well. An exceptional ability indeed. He rigidly flailed his arms, briefly confusing Midoriya. Was this just one of Ida's quirks? Aside from engine. Nothing too special, huh? Takage cocked an eyebrow, smirking. Sure didn't look that way with you crushing all the tests today. Yeah, Mr. First Place. Your Araka teased. Come on, guys. Midoriya rubbed his neck bashfully. Your quirks are way more interesting than mine. Bakugo, who was walking past them, overheard Midoriya and scoffed. Ain't that the truth? Before anyone could retort, the explosive teen had already stomped off with his hands in his pockets. Jeez, Ashido shook her head, frowning. Such in a hole. I don't get why Kirishima-kun is trying to befriend him. Kirishima-kun, huh? Takage turned to the pink girl with a sly grin. By the way, are you two dating or something? Ashido looked back at the greenette with a proud smile. Yep. We went to the same junior high and high schools. We started dating in our second year of high school. The group continued to converse as they walked down a flight of stairs. I see. Takage was definitely interested. High school sweethearts? Huh. You'll have to give us the rundown soon. Sure thing. Ashido beamed. But, Yuraka interjected. You're not worried your relationship will get in the way of your future hero careers. She looked mildly concerned. Well, at first, we were when we started dating. But, Ashido smiled wistfully. Kirishima told me that people shouldn't live with any regrets and that included heroes. He's pretty good at giving inspirational phrases like that sometimes. She giggled. It just really resonated with me, y'all know. Ada nodded in agreement. Yes, the path of a pro hero is a dangerous line of work. Tomorrow isn't guaranteed. After all, I'm not an expert in romantic relationships. But I imagine it'd be awful to die without telling someone you care for how you feel, or worse, vice versa. No one noticed, but Midoriya frowned at that statement. You have no idea. His expression didn't go unnoticed by a certain heiress, who glanced at him worriedly, but Midoriya seemed to recover quickly before she could ask what was wrong. Maybe she could bring it up later. Reaching the first floor, they walked through the main lobby and towards the main doors. I suppose that makes sense. Yeyurazu refocused on the topic at hand, and you're both aiming to be heroes, so there should be an understanding between you two when you sometimes can't spend time together. Unless you sign on at the same agency, of course. Now that would be cool. Ashido lit up at that suggestion. Besides, there's plenty of hero power couples out there. Takage pointed out. It can work as long as you're both reasonable about it. They walked outside and down the long pathway that stretched toward the main gate. Ashido felt her skirt vibrate and reached into her pocket. Pulling out her phone, she read a text message and looked back at the group. Oh, sorry, I gotta run. Kirishima-kun and I are meeting somewhere this evening. Catch you guys later. She ran down the pathway and through the gate, disappearing around the corner. I guess I better get going too. Siro spoke up. Don't want to miss my train. See you guys tomorrow. They waved goodbye and then Ada nodded to them. I am afraid that I must say goodbye as well. My own train is at a different station. All right, see you tomorrow then, Ada-san. Midoriya waved. Once Ada had left, only Midoriya, Yuraka, Yeyurazu, and Takage remained. Then, before anyone could say anything, someone called out to the group. Hey, wait up, guys. They turned to see Tsunotori running up to them, smiling brightly. Oh hey, Pony. Was wondering where you ran off to after class, Midoriya offhandedly said. She stopped in front of them, and wasn't even slightly out of breath. Sorry, I was actually talking to a few students from the 101B class in the hallway. They seemed pretty nice. I even exchanged numbers with a couple of them. That's neat. Maybe it would be a good idea to talk with some students in the 101B class at some point, Midoriya suggested. I mean, they're in the hero course too, after all. Yeyurazu, Yuraka, and Takage all approved of the suggestion. Sure, why not? 
Takage shrugged, with her usual proactive grin. Yeah, that sounds like it could be fun. Iraraka agreed. I am admittedly curious to see what they're like. Yei Arazu said. Perhaps we can even help each other when we're not competing. Competing? Midoriya questioned. Like in games or something? Kind of. It's sort of been a new a tradition for the NB Hero course classes to compete against each other. Both in grades, joint training, and overall performance. Yei Arazu elaborated. A rivalry of sorts. Huh, I think I heard about that. Actually, Takage mentioned. It's supposed to mimic the competition that pro heroes face in the field in some ways. Gets us in the competitive mindset before we even enter the field. Right. Makes sense, I guess. Midoriya dubiously noted. Midoriya had thought it over many times and each time, he arrived at the same conclusion. He wasn't a supporter of the pro hero ranking system as it essentially forced heroes to compete against each other in order to earn higher wages and notoriety. On one hand, it could motivate heroes to improve themselves and be more mindful about their jobs, which was good. On the other hand, that kind of competition where livelihoods and pride were on the line often bred corruption and resentment. He thought that kind of system worked fine in settings like professional sports which were entertainment businesses. But it didn't have a place in a public servant setting that firefighters, police officers, and pro heroes occupied. At least, that's what Midoriya believed. Of course, the super soldier would admit that he was biased in that belief. After all, he did come from a team-first environment in the army. Additionally, he recognized that perhaps there's something he's not taking into consideration with the ranking system. For now, he'd wait and withhold judgment. Izuku, by the way, Tsunotori looked up at the verdette with sparkling eyes, that stance you used in the ball throw exercise. It was from baseball, wasn't it? Why does she sound impressed? It was nothing special. He wondered. Oh, why yeah. Just a simple wind-up pitch. He replied as if it were common knowledge. Of course, I changed up the normal throwing motion a bit so I could throw the ball higher rather than straight ahead. Wind-up pitch. Iraraka repeated. You mean the way you threw the ball earlier? Uh, yeah. It's a stance nearly all baseball pitchers use to efficiently throw balls. Midoriya answered. Baseball? Iraraka tilted her head, a question mark appearing over her head. Never heard of it. Kakage shrugged, equally clueless. Is that a game or something? Midoriya's eyes slightly widened. What are they talking about? Even if they don't follow baseball, they should at least be aware of what it is. Baseball has been popular in Japan for a long time. Yeirazu hummed thoughtfully. It does sound familiar. I believe it was a sport that originated from America nearly three centuries ago. It was popular for a long time, even in Japan, but faded away after quirks started becoming the norm. What? The super soldier couldn't believe what he was hearing. Yeah, it was. Tsunotori confirmed, shocking the verdette even further. Though no one really plays it anymore, it's still a part of American culture, in some ways. Every 4th of July a lot of communities will organize a mock baseball game for people to enjoy, for tradition's sake and all. I recognized Midoriya's stance from one of those games I watched when I was younger. She smiled fondly as if she were reminiscing on a cherished memory. Baseball isn't a thing anymore. Midoriya felt disheartened hearing this news. Granted, he wasn't a huge baseball fanatic or anything like that. The reality that a sport that was always a constant in his time was no longer around greatly emphasized how he was in a new world. Many things he was familiar with and loved were either gone or displayed in a museum. What else isn't around anymore? Do I really want to find out? Um, Izuku, you okay? Sunotori asked, noticing his spaced outlook. Midoriya didn't respond as he was lost in his thoughts. The girls looked at each other, bewildered. What was up with him? Midori-kun, Yeirazu sounded concerned. Are you alright? Oh, Midoriya snapped out his stupor and became flustered when he realized that he had spaced out. Uh, why yeah, I'm fine. Just got lost in thought there for a second. Must have been something important for you to space out like that. Takage pointed out. No, not really. Midoriya half lied and looked up with a small smile. Anyways, to answer your question, Pony, I knew someone who could pitch very well when I was younger. I based my throw off his stance and everything. That's all. Oh, I see. Sunotori's smile widened. Well, I thought it was really cool to see that stance. And your throw was awesome. T thanks. Midoriya smiled sheepishly before he turned to Yuraka and Yeirazu. Although, I think you both really killed it in that test. Yeah, it is kind of hard to beat infinity and three kilometers. Sunotori chuckled. Though they technically didn't throw the ball like we did, so does it really count? Takage jokingly argued. Aizawa-sensei stated he didn't care how we did it as long as we stayed in the circle. Yeirazu pointed out. And we did, so it definitely counts. Iraraka affirmed. A thought occurred to the pony girl. By the way, do you know why Aizawa-sensei singled you out in the test today, Izuku? That question made the other girls perk up. Yeah, that was really unfair of him. Iraraka added. I'll admit, Yeirazu chimed in. That did throw me for a loop. It was pretty random. Did it have something to do with you being first in the practical? 
Takage inquired. Sort of. I think Aizawa sensei wanted to test how strong I was without my shield. Midoriya answered. I used it to acquire nearly all of my villain points in the exam, so he may have thought that my quirk wasn't strong enough to be in the hero course or something along those lines. Oh, I guess that makes sense. Still, Tsunotori cutely pouted. That was pretty mean to threaten you and everyone else like that. Yeah, I didn't like his methods either, but I get why he did it. Midoriya played devil's advocate. Urgency brings out the best in others. Gay Arazu nodded in agreement. Yes, I suppose that makes sense. So, that means Mr. Aizawa was serious about expelling Midori-kun if he didn't impress him. Does that mean he may have been serious about expelling last place too? I wonder what could have changed his mind. She contemplated. Well, it certainly brought out our best. Takage grinned. All of us placed in the top ten, right? Oh yeah, that's right. Iraraka smiled widely. It is nice to know we're not starting off at the bottom, but we shouldn't get complacent. Yeyarazu sagely said. Much is expected of us going forward. We have to keep improving. Got that right. Takage playfully patted the raven on the back. I can't stay at number six forever, now can I? Sunotori nodded, smiling determinedly. And I can't stay at number nine either. Recalling her tenth place ranking. Yuraka realized it was neither bad nor great, just average. She frowned, that wouldn't do. She had plenty of work ahead of her if she wanted to catch up to her classmates and friends level. Perhaps she would take up Midoriya on those morning training sessions that he had offered to her earlier. She might lose a couple hours of potential sleep every day, but that sacrifice was totally worth it if she got stronger. Right, Yuraka turned to smirk at her verdette friend. Hear that, Midori-kun. Don't get too comfortable at the top. We'll be coming for you. Yamomo might be the closest, but Tsunotori-san, Takage-san, and I aren't far behind either. Midoriya nodded. Good. Glad I'll have you guys to keep me on my toes then. He smiled confidently. Just know I won't make it easy on you. If you're going to beat me, you'll have to train hard and bring your a-games. With how amazing all of you are, you'll catch up in no time. You'll get way stronger than I ever could. Midoriya happily mused. One might think that he'd be discouraged or even a bit dismayed by most of his friends and classmates overtaking him. However, the first hero knew from personal experience that he didn't need to be the strongest hero around to help others. The door to Midoriya's apartment opened as the verdette casually walked inside. Closing the door and locking it, he laid his yellow satchel by his work desk. He had just returned from a small tea shop close to UAS campus with Yeirazu, Yuraka, Sunotori, and Takage at the former's request. It was a good time. He enjoyed talking and getting to know his new friends in Pony and Takage a little better. He even asked them both questions about their quirks and had already started entries in his notebook. There was still more to fill out, but he had plenty of time to do so. He'd also made entries for his other classmates as the semester progressed. He, Yamomo, and Yuraka chan even exchanged numbers with both of them and started a group chat for organizing study groups or just friendly conversation. They planned to ask Ada, Ashido, Kirishima, and Siro if they'd be interested in exchanging contact information as well. Perhaps they'd even ask a few others in the class if they'd be interested too. Midoriya was hoping at least Ada would accept as he could use another guy in the group to talk to, while he wasn't as by the book as his bespeckled classmate. During their talks today he and Ida had discovered that they were both equally enthusiastic about hero protocols and patterns. He thought it'd be fun to discuss team-up ideas and strategies with him using their classmates as examples. Midoriya would ask him tomorrow. He had plenty of reading to do tonight with the hero course syllabus and UA University's history. Seriously, when did they start using that phrase, plus ultra? First, he needed to check an item off of his itinerary. Taking a seat at his work desk, he reached into the drawer and pulled out a notebook with the title reports written on it. Turning to a blank page, he picked up a pen to start writing in English. From Captain America to Commander-in-Chief Protocol, activity report the first day at JP's U University has concluded. While most of the regular classes started off in a conventional manner not worthy of mention, this was not the case for Foundational Heroics 101A. The instructor for the class, Aizawa Shoda, had us running right out of the gate by giving us a quirk apprehension test to test the limits of everyone's current strength and abilities. I earned the top spot in class, somehow, as I suspected. There are some powerful individuals in my class of 20. The other 20 of the 40 hero course students are in a separate class called 101B, and I can only imagine what their abilities are. I'll have to increase my gymnastics and martial arts training if I want to stay ahead, or even keep up. They will not be making it easy on me, and I am relieved by that fact. Tomorrow will be the field portion of the heroic class, taught by JP's number one hero, All Might. If today taught me anything, I suspect he likely will have us doing a fighting exercise to teach the class how to use their abilities in combat, or something along those lines. That's just my hunch though. Nevertheless, a soldier doesn't back down from challenges, and neither will I. 
My next report will summarize the aftermath of tomorrow's field class. Finishing his report, he closed the book and placed it back in the drawer. Okay, he reached into his satchel to pull out his laptop. Time for some more research. In hindsight, I probably should have done this sooner. Navigating to a popular search engine, he typed in the phrase UA University History and pressed the enter key. Musutafu, Japan, April 2197 Nighttime. A natural slotted time for rest and recovery. Even the mightiest of warriors needed their sleep to function properly. However, sleep didn't always come easy for everyone. Midoriya Izuku tossed and turned in his full-sized bed, his brows and facial expression contorting in distress. Flashes of the past played through his head like a broken movie clip. Gunfire. Explosions. Blood. Dead bodies. Midoriya groaned as his breathing increased. Sweat began to accumulate on his brow, an unpleasant scene vaguely replayed in his sleep. It's not gonna hold. We'll find another way. Just hang on. I'm sorry, but the world needs Captain America. No, don't keep going plus ultra, Cap. Good luck. No, please, don't. Midoriya's emerald eyes shot open and he immediately sat up from his bed, instinctively reaching for a combat knife he kept nearby. He frantically looked around the dark room for any danger with the weapon ready in hand. Seeing that he was alone in his apartment, he lowered the knife and felt his body relax ever so slightly. His breathing was hectic as sweat poured down his face. The super soldier placed the knife back on his bedstand and glanced over at his alarm clock. Groaning at the time the blocky red numbers displayed, 4. Not again. Same nightmare. Midoriya sighed deeply. Midoriya sat on the edge of his bed, resting his head in his hands. He remained in that position for several moments until he felt that he had finally calmed himself down. He deeply exhaled. Maybe I should look into getting a futon. Bed is too soft. Oh well, might as well get today started. With no chance of returning to sleep, Midoriya started on his morning training an hour early. Again, after taking a long swig of water from a thermos sitting by his bed, he quickly put on a set of jogging pants and a t-shirt. A little running on the beach usually helps clear my head. Midoriya mused. Should also practice those new moves I've been learning too. Midoriya spent the next two and a half hours training at Tacoba Beach. It was a longer session than usual, but he had extra stress he needed to work off. He returned to his apartment to shower afterwards, ate a hearty breakfast, and got changed into the hero department uniform. Fully dressed and fed, the verdette proceeded to exit until a couple knocks on the door caught him by surprise. He tensed up, still on edge from his nightmare. Midori-kun, are you awake? Recognizing Yuraka-chan's cheery voice, he quickly relaxed his muscles. Oh wait, what am I saying? Of course you are. He smiled and rolled his eyes at her remark before opening the door. Yuraka was dressed in her uniform with her school bag strapped to her back, looking at him with those warm auburn eyes. Good morning, Midori-kun. Good morning, Yuraka-chan. You're up earlier today. It's, he paused to check his watch, 7.15. Yuraka grinned. Well, we are UA Hero Corps students. We need to set a good example, right? Midoriya grinned at his brunette companion who was repeating his words from yesterday. Right you are. He nodded. Also, Yamomo suggested we meet up at that tea place we were at yesterday before class today. Did you not read the text? She asked curiously. Oh, I'm sorry. He smiled sheepishly. I was so focused on training this morning and then getting ready for the day that I didn't check my phone. That's okay. Iraraka waved off. But would you like to come with us? It's still early and isn't far from campus. So, she winked. We can still get to class early like you want. It's not early. It's on time. Midoriya coyly retorted. And yeah, that sounds good. I could use some green tea. Actually. Sweet. Let's head off then. She cheerily exclaimed. In that moment, Midoriya felt the stress from his latest nightmare melt away from her enthusiasm and bright smile. Yuraka sure had a knack for brightening his mood, he thought, making casual small talk. The pair walked to the station and hopped on a train to the nearest station by UAS campus. However, Yuraka noticed that something seemed slightly off about Midoriya. He wasn't as engaging in their conversations as he normally was and was sometimes looking off in the distance with a troubled expression. As the pair disembarked from the train and navigated their way out of the station, Yuraka decided to address the issue while no one was around them. Hey, Midori-kun. Yeah, what's up? Are you feeling okay today? She looked concerned. Midoriya blinked, caught off guard by her question. Why yeah? Why do you ask? I dunno, she shrugged. You just seem out of it this morning. Like something's bothering you. Right. I haven't been talking much. Midoriya realized. Stupid nightmare still on my mind. Well, like Bucky said, I need to buck up. Can't let her worry about me. Midoriya turned to her with a soft, reassuring smile. Oh, I'm alright, Yuraka-chan. It's just, I had one of those nights where you can't fall asleep no matter how much you try, so I'm just a little drained this morning. I'll be okay though. I mean, it's not a total lie. Oh, I see. Yuraka nodded in understanding. Yeah, I hate those kinds of nights too. 
They're the worst, huh? Midoriya nodded, sighing. Tell me about it. Your Araka discreetly glanced back at Midoriya with mild concern. She didn't believe her friend was lying per se, but it was clear that something else was bugging him. She wouldn't pry unless he got worse. He'd talk about it when he was ready, she thought. Eventually the pair arrived at a small pink building nestled on a small plot of land. Outside the establishment was a familiar black limousine that several passing pedestrians stared at. However, it had become a common sight these days for the Verdette and Brunette pair. As soon as Midoriya and Yuraka stepped into view, Yeyarazu opened the door and stepped out with a bright smile to greet them. Thanking her driver and waving him off, she walked alongside her best friends down a small pathway into the establishment. A few bystanders, some even being UA students, were dumbfounded by the unusual trio. Moments later, the trio walked out of the building with lidded cups in hand and down the sidewalk towards UA University's campus, a quaint little setup they have. Midoriya commented, How'd you find out about that place, Yamomo? He took a sip of his green tea and felt his nerves calm ever so slightly. Well, this establishment is one of the few that carry my favorite brand of tea. Gold Tips Imperial, Yeyarazu replied. So, I like to keep tabs on them. Sounds fancy. Hiroraka commented while taking a sip of her green tea, deciding to get the same order as Midori. After all, some studies showed that green tea did help calm nerves, improve memory retention, and comprehension. Yeyarazu smiled sheepishly. Yes, well, I suppose it is. She then frowned. I hope you both don't think I'm flaunting money or anything of the sort. That was certainly not my intent. Relax, Yamomo. Yeah, Midoriya patted her shoulder in reassurance. We know. Yeah, we know you're not like that. So, don't worry. Yuraka chimed in. You were just showing us a nice place to get drinks. The fact that it's only a few minutes walk from campus is a big plus. The word plus suddenly triggered a memory from last night before Midoriya had turned into bed. Out of curiosity, he had searched online for the history of UA University's school motto. Something on your mind, Midori-kun? Yeyarazu inquired, noticing his thoughtful visage. Actually, yeah. Last night, I was doing some research on UA University's history, specifically, the school motto's origin. Midoriya answered. All the articles sort of contradicted each other, none of them really gave me a clear answer. That's a pretty specific thing to search for. Why the sudden interest? Yuraka asked curiously. Well, plus Ultra was a saying that sometimes Captain America used, right? So, I was curious if they adopted it from him or something. The Verdette replied. Oh, I can answer that. Ye Urazu perked up. You're right that Plus Ultra was a saying originally coined by Captain America. History records and old posters prove that much. During the captain's time in Japan, many of the metahumans he helped rescue used the phrase as part of their equal rights rallies. Morino Hiroshi, one of UA University's founders, was one of the many people liberated from the concentration camps by the captain, and he established Plus Ultra as the school's official motto in reverence of the captain years after his disappearance. Midoriya and Yuraka both blinked at Yeyurazu's detailed reply. I, uh, she stammered, blushing slightly. Have done a lot of research on the captain. Yuraka grinned at her. I'll say, Yamomo. Heck, even I didn't know all that. You're definitely the queen of Captain America Odakus. Yeyurazu looked away as her blush intensified. Well, a lot of my research was necessary for my story too. Midoriya couldn't suppress a smile. He never would have dreamed such a simple saying that he used to push himself further in times of crisis would have such an effect on people. Processing Yeyarazu's explanation further, he wondered why the articles he found were inconclusive on the matter. I see. Still, I can't help but wonder why this isn't common knowledge. There seems to be a lot of disagreement on the internet. He noted, well, a lot of history from that time period was sadly lost, so there's not much conclusive evidence for it. Yeyarazu answered, also, it's likely due to the fact that UA has been around for a long time, and the motto essentially became synonymous with the institution and the great pro-heroes it has helped produce. That's where the confusion comes from. That makes sense. Yuraka nodded. I mean, when you hear Plus Ultra your first thought always goes to UA, after all. Nothing wrong with that, I suppose. I mean, it's not like I trademarked the saying anyway. He internally chuckled. Otherwise, UA would have some royalties they'd have to pay. Let's see, we have algebra this morning at 9 being taught by Ectoplasm Sensei. Then, we'll have our first heroics field class at 15.30. Hiroraka recalled. We'll have lots of free time on Tuesdays and Thursdays then, huh? Yeah, no kidding. A five-hour intermission is pretty generous of the schedule makers. Midoriya remarked. It does make things flexible for us. Yeyarazu pointed out. Got a feeling we'll likely be spending that time study, completing assignments, using the training grounds, and lunch of course. Midoriya stated. Got to stay ahead of the curve, right? 
Both girls nodded in agreement. The trio walked past UAS main gateway and down the pathway that led to the main buildings. So, are you guys excited for our first day of heroic field class? Iraraka finished her tea and disposed of the cup in a nearby trash can. I wonder if the rumors of All Might being our instructor are true. She sounded excited. Well, the syllabus didn't say who the instructor was going to be, so who can say? Maybe it will be him. Midoriya already knew that Yagi would be their instructor, but that didn't mean he had to spoil the surprise for his friends. Yes, I'm very keen to get started. Yeyurazu smiled. It'll be our first steps into becoming heroes. Ooh, I can't wait. Iraraka's shoulders slumped as she sighed heavily. First, we just have to get through boring math today. You shouldn't overlook mathematics, Yuraka chan Yeyurazu lightly admonished. It's still a crucial part of our education. Plus, with your quirk, having a good understanding of math and physics could go a long way in the hero field. Midoriya reasoned. Huh. Yuraka blinked twice. I never considered that. A thought occurred to her. Wait, my quirk removes an object's gravitational pull though, so wouldn't that mean I'd have to study reverse physics or something? Hmm. Yeyurazu cutely tapped her chin in contemplation. Yes, I suppose you would. Yuraka Achako, evil doctor of anti-physics. Midoriya playfully commented. The sworn enemy to Sir Isaac Newton and Nikolaus Copernicus alike. Yeyurazu added, smiling slyly. Truly, a nefarious and dastardly villain of the cosmos. In accordance with the laws of physics, she must be brought down effective immediately for the universe to continue. PFFT. The brunette couldn't contain her laughter, and playfully shoved them. You both are dorks. Ha ha ha. While standing in between them, she placed her hands on their shoulders, careful to lift up her pinky fingers. But I guess you're my dorks. Ha <laughs> ha. Midoriya glanced at her with a smirk. Don't act like you're above us, professor. You're just as bad as we are. But in a good way though. The auburn-haired girl chuckled bashfully. Yeah, I guess you're right. Oh great king of Captain America Odakus. Please, I'm not deserving of such a title. Midoriya rubbed his neck sheepishly. Especially when guys like All Might and Kalsen are duking it out for that dubious honor. Oh brother. Yeyarazu, meanwhile, couldn't contain her beautiful, elated smile. Her life had changed for the better since Yuraka and Midoriya both became her best friends, a stark contrast to the extravagant yet dull life she had been living before with mostly training and constant study. She was looking forward to spending even more time together with them and her fellow classmates in their shared pursuit of becoming pro-heroes. A realization then occurred to the heiress and her eyes widened. My word, we've been friends for a while now and I have yet to invite Midori-kun or Yuraka chan to my house. I have to correct this. I'll ask them if they'd like to come over soon. Hopefully they'll say yes. Meanwhile, as the trio proceeded to the main doors, another hero course student was nearby and noticed them, particularly how close they seemed to be getting to a certain green-haired young man. Orig, mind a seat as he clenched his teeth in envy. That lucky bastard. Fort Erskine, Cod July 2042. Eight days had passed since Izuku's start of SSR training and each one was longer and more arduous than the last. Izuku had already expected to struggle in his first few days of boot camp, but he had been confident that he would eventually adapt and the training would become easier, if only slightly. That was not the case, however, as Corporal Yamamoto was a relentless drill instructor. If he thought day one had been grueling, the following days only got progressively worse. She increased all of the exercise repetitions with each passing day, not enough to injure them, but enough to make their entire bodies very sore and worn out. She had even introduced drills from standard army basic training, such as wall scaling, army crawling under barbed wire, and finally traversing rope bridges and ladders. In the midst of the pained exhaustion, Izuku sometimes couldn't prevent pessimistic thoughts from arising, but those thoughts would always be pushed away when he recalled Bucky's words from day one. Don't you dare at any point try to quit on me, no matter how hard it gets, ya here, cause I won't be quitting on you, ever. With that, his determination was always reignited, and he found the strength to press on. Izuku sometimes couldn't help but wonder if Peggy was actively trying to make him quit. He had noticed that out of all the recruits she always seemed to target him the most whenever she could, calling him out for the smallest of mistakes or demanding he go faster in the drills. In addition, she had been avoiding him during times outside of training. However, he pushed those leery thoughts aside and opted to give his friend the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps this was her way of motivating him. Maybe she was just too busy to talk with him in the evenings or didn't want to risk a misunderstanding of their relationship with the other recruits. All of that made sense, he thought. Izuku didn't have time to ruminate on the subject, though. It was the start of day 9 and the recruits were currently in the middle of their morning conditioning drills. The sun was rising higher in the sky and the heat was steadily increasing. But, at this point, Izuku had become numb to it all. He followed orders and completed the exercises, when he wasn't passing out or stopping to puke, at the pace his frail body allowed. On the bright side, his new combat uniform had arrived yesterday, and it was appropriately sized to fit his smaller body. 
He felt a little better knowing that he at least didn't look like a dork while training anymore. He could only take so much teasing from his pals for wearing such a baggy uniform. That's enough warm-ups, Corporal Yamamoto shouted. Everyone fall back into formation. The recruits immediately complied and stood at attention in line, with Izuku lagging behind only slightly. Peggy's eyes briefly focused on Izuku to search for any mistake in his stance but found none. It was textbook perfect. She inwardly growled at that fact, but quickly decided to move on. We're going to switch things up today by starting with pugil stick drills. We'll work off all that pent-up stress and frustration from the last few days. All of you head there and await instruction. Yes ma'am. The group complied. Cadet Midoriya, a word. Corporal Yamamoto called out. Izuku left the formation and ran up to the Ravenet Marine. He tried to maintain a neutral, straight face but the confusion was present in his brown eyes. Why yes ma'am, I see that Private Barnes has been officially recognized as your battle buddy. She stated, yes ma'am, how has he been treating you? She inquired, he's been very supportive. Izuku resisted the urge to smile. He's been teaching me how to march properly and the formation movements in our free time. He still didn't understand why Bucky wanted to be his battle buddy following day one when he literally could have chosen anyone else. Someone more physically fit and closer to his age even. Nevertheless, he was grateful for the Brunnett's support as well as the encouragement he had received from his other friends and Sharon, Namor, James, and Nick. It felt surreal to him knowing that he had friends outside of Peggy now. If there was one silver lining in this training camp from hell, he had met those five amazing people. The other recruits didn't seem like bad people either. He just didn't get much opportunity to converse with them like he did his circle of friends. I see, Peggy replied. So that's how he's gotten better in formations recently. Well, I'm glad you both are getting along, and he's taken you under his wing. But I'll cut to the chase of why I called you over here, she narrowed her gaze. In the upcoming Pugil Stick match, you need to win at least one round. Everyone gets three rounds each. If you fail to win one, then not only will you have to do extra exercises for punishment this evening, but Private Barnes will as well. Izuku's eyes widened in surprise. I, I don't, you both come as a pair now. She tersely explained, meaning you'll not only enjoy victory together, but suffer in defeat together as well. The short teen considered Peggy's words. I, understand, ma'am. Corporal Yamamoto nodded. Good, don't discuss what we talked about with anyone else. Am I clear? Yes ma'am, dismissed. With that said, Izuku turned and sprinted toward the pugil drill set up across the training field, aside from Taruko. Barnes has been the most supportive of Izu-kun. He's likely one of the reasons now why he hasn't quit yet. Well, we'll see how far that support goes when he has to suffer with Izu-kun too. Peggy felt very awful with herself in going through with this plan. But she was out of options. Increasing the physical workload wasn't working like she thought it would. Izuku, albeit slowly, just kept getting back up and pushing on. His perseverance earned him the respect and support of his peers, which only pushed him further. He truly was the personification of mind over matter, she thought. So, if physical hardship wouldn't make Izuku quit, then perhaps targeting Izuku's newfound friendship with Barnes would. If she could make Barnes even slightly annoyed with Izuku over his shortcomings, maybe it would be discouraging enough to prompt Izuku to reconsider his place in the military. Peggy lowered her head, knitting her brows together. I feel like such BTCH doing this, but this is my last chance. There's only one more day left before the ten days are up. Pugil sticks, a heavily padded pole-like weapon, had been used in the U.S. Army since the 1940s. It was a part of hand-to-hand -hand combat training for simulating rifle and bayonet combat. Pugil bouts were usually conducted with hard contact while wearing protective gear, padded gloves, and football helmets. The matches were divided by weight class and monitored by three judges who would use the 10-point must system to determine winners. The goal was to use the pugil stick to knock an opponent to the ground, inflict the most disabling blows, and, or force them to submit. A judge would step in and call the match whenever necessary. Roughly half an hour had passed since the pugil stick drill began, and Izuku had already lost two matches. Wielding a pugil stick that was as big as he was proved to be very challenging. It didn't help that these kinds of drills required a considerable amount of physical strength, something Izuku was considerably lacking. Final matchup, Howlett and Midoriya. Let's go, the instructor shouted. With his name called, Izuku stepped into a sandpit with James standing at the other end. Both were equipped with the proper protective gear and a pugil stick. Come on, you got this, Zuku. Sharon clapped. Give it your best, bud. Bucky shouted. Izuku gave a thumbs up before inserting his mouth guard. This is it, my last chance to get a win. If I don't, Bucky and I both will have to do punishment drills. Izuku worriedly thought. James grinned roguishly. Not going easy on ya, shorty. Better come at me with all you got. He beat his buff chest to pump himself up. Izuku wordlessly nodded with a straight face expression. 
So far, he had only been pitted against James or Sharon since they were the closest to his weight class. He was the only lightweight in the group with James and Sharon being middleweight. Both had defeated him rather easily. Okay, James is faster, stronger, and more experienced than me. I'm at a huge disadvantage here. Izuku contemplated. He considered the rules of pugil stick matches and what was allowed. One hand needed to be on the stick at all times while punches, elbows, kicks, and knees were allowed as long as they were not aimed for the head nor if the opponent was already grounded. There's no way he'll submit, and I won't be able to get enough solid blows to his vital areas before he takes me down first. I'll have to knock him down fast. That's my only chance. Fighters, ready. The instructor ordered. I have to win this. Izuku's grip on the pugil stick tightened. I won't make Bucky suffer with me. The rowdy cheers from the other recruits were drowned out as James and Izuku stared at each other with determined expression. Both were aiming to win. Start. An instructor shouted, staying close by to intervene if needed. Neither combatant wasted time in charging forward at full speed. Izuku knew he couldn't outmuscle James. His opponent was stronger and heavier, so he opted for the only option he could think of to give himself a chance of winning. At the last second, Izuku juked to the right while extending the end of his pugil stick to poke at James' feet. Whoa. James stumbled forward and swiftly extended his stick out toward the ground to break his fall. Izuku followed up with swinging his stick's upper end at the back of James' legs, attempting to knock his opponent to his knee. However, James was quick to react by kicking himself out of the way using his stick to hold himself upright. James pulled his pugil stick off the ground and turned to face his opponent. Cheap shot, shorty. He charged and swung at Izuku's head forcing him to hold up his pole to block the attack. James pressed forward with his assault, forcing Izuku to backtrack. Izuku felt the force behind each strike and knew he wouldn't last much longer. Plan A failed. Time for Plan B. Izuku ascertained. The frail teen quickly ducked off to the side to avoid a strike and used his pole to swipe up sand at the burly young man's face. A-H-H. James was forced to shut his eyes, giving Izuku the opening he needed to swing his stick at his opponent's helmet as hard as he could. The O.F. A hit. I finally got a hit. Izuku momentarily paused, unable to suppress an excited grin. Keep pressing. Bucky shouted out. You have to finish, Zuku. Sharon followed up. Right. Izuku snapped out of his stupor, extending his stick to jab James in the chest, causing James to stagger back. The fight's not over till it's over. Izuku stepped forward to press his attack and swung at James' head again. But much to his surprise, James brought up his pugil stick to perfectly block the strike even with his eyes still shut from the sand. Howdy, James instantly recovered and pushed forward, increasing the speed and strength behind his blows. Whatever momentum Izuku had gained was promptly lost as he was put back on the defensive. One blow was strong enough to cause Izuku to stagger back. He didn't get the chance to recover as James used his pole to sweep his legs out from underneath him, sending the skinny teen falling to the sand. Damn it, should have gone for his legs, got too cocky. All right, enough, an instructor called out. Izuku sighed deeply and picked himself up. Crap. I lost the match. That means, the instructor stepped in between Izuku and James and held up the latter's arm. Midoriya failed to maintain a fighter's stance. Winner, Howlett. The recruits clapped and cheered in response. Nice recovery, Howlett. Mick cheered enthusiastically. Good effort by you though, Flagman. Keep your chin up. Namor added blandly. You did well. Izuku and James both nodded in acknowledgement for their efforts and walked out of the sandpit, pulling the protective gear and helmet off and handing them back to the various fort personnel. All right, all right, recruits, get in formation. Corporal Yamamoto stepped in after watching the pugil stick exercises. Everyone complied with her order, breathing heavily and sweaty from the intense matches. It's five minutes till lunchtime. Head back to the dining facility, and we'll pick up at 12.30. Dismissed. Yes ma'am. But that, the recruits proceeded in the direction of the dining facility. While they were jogging, Bucky noticed Izuku looked quite despondent. Was he disappointed that he lost all of his matches? Hey, don't worry about it, but just shake it off. Bucky patted his shoulder reassuringly. You'll get him in the next match. Why yeah, thanks, Izuku murmured, not looking at him. How could he? Because of his shortcomings, his new friend would be punished later too. Don't be too disappointed, Zuku. Sharon jogged up to the pair. You did much better in that match than all of your previous ones. Yeah, Bucky agreed, using the stick to kick sand into Howlett's face. A little dirty, but hey dot 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 good thinking on your part. Never seen anyone do that in a pugil match. Actually, it was a good effort, but don't expect that dirty trick to work again, shorty. James called out from ahead, overhearing their conversation. Izuku couldn't help but smile a little from the praise and encouragement. He wasn't used to receiving it from anyone else outside Peggy or his mother. He quickly pushed that lamenting thought aside. Don't stress about it. Tell you what, how about I give you some pointers on fighting with a pugil stick tonight? Bucky grinned. But first, let's hurry up and get something to eat already. Oh okay. 
Izuku nodded. Race y'all guys. Sharon rushed forward. Harder. Bucky couldn't resist the challenge and pursued after her. Izuku increased his pace to try and keep up, but his heart wasn't into the impromptu race. I wonder though. He frowned morosely. Will you even want to talk with me anymore after today? Musutafu, Japan, April 2197 so far. It's pretty normal for university life. Midoriya thought. After yesterday's sudden quirk assessment test in foundational heroics, Midoriya had wondered if all of the hero course classes would be unconventional. So far, that was not the case. The morning's algebra class has been conducted in a professional, conventional manner by the pro-hero, ectoplasm. Hopefully the other non-heroic classes for tomorrow will be the same, he thought, after the class period ended. Most of the class broke off to do their own things, taking advantage of the free time provided to them. Midoriya and a group consisting of Yeyorazu, Yuraka, Tsunotori, Takage, and Ida met up in the university library at a table to quietly discuss plans on what to do for their five-hour intermission for the rest of the semester. After all, it was valuable time, and they didn't want to waste it by fooling around when they should, could be improving themselves academically and physically. They agreed to reserve Tuesdays for study and catching up on assignments together while Thursdays would be dedicated to moderate training at the designated training grounds. While there, the Verdette successfully exchanged contact information with Ida and he was added to the group chat. Then lunchtime rolled around, and the super soldier enjoyed eating alongside his friends and classmates. At a single table, the group sat together with the additions of Siro, Gyro, and Asui. All three of them seemed to have a casual and relaxed aura about them, but in different ways. To Midoriya, it felt good casually conversing with people his age again as it reminded him of the good times in the army. Iraraka and Yeyurazu sat on his right and left side respectively while Takage and Tsunotori sat across from him with the others filling the other spots. Gotta say, Lunch Rush's food is impressive, Midoriya commented. The pro hero, Lunch Rush, was a disaster relief hero. A type of support hero that made food for people displaced by natural disasters or powerful villain incident. His quirk allowed him to cook high-quality food with the same speed and efficiency of a team of 30 chefs. Midoriya imagined that the university saved quite a few paychecks by only having a few other cafeteria staff needed to keep the place clean. I know, right. Iraraka beamed, taking a bite from her rice bowl. It is good stuff. Siro nodded with a smile. Surprised it doesn't cost extra. It is very tasty. Yeyorazu smiled as she enjoyed her lunch. As expected of a pro-like lunch rush, Ada nodded, taking a sip from his drink. Midoriya had quite an assortment of different foods on his tray, the main dish being katsudon. He'd been excited to see his favorite food offered. It wasn't as good as his mom's used to be, in his personal opinion, but it was still great, nonetheless. He almost teared up at the thought of his mother, but he composed himself before anyone noticed, not wanting to cause a scene. What do you guys think the field class will be like? Gyro questioned a few moments later. Probably just some introductions and basics. That makes the most sense, Kiro. Asui replied as she looked towards the perplet. That does sound reasonable. Yeyorazu nodded in agreement. I can't imagine them giving us an intense assignment on what's technically our first day since all we did was pick up our syllabuses yesterday. Keep in mind that this is UA. Ida pointed out. If our field instructor is anything like Aizawa-sensei, then. He trailed off and everyone's faces took on a thoughtful or worried expression. Yes, I suppose that is true. Yeyorazu admitted. So, hope for the best but prepare for the worst. Siro shrugged, half smiling. Yes, that may be for the best. Ada nodded. I'm sure it'll be fine with Tashinori teaching. Midoriya thought as he continued to eat. No worries, guys. We got this in the back. Takage confidently said, trying to break the tense mood. We'll just have to do our best. Sunotori nodded determinedly. I just hope we won't be threatened with expulsion again. Yuraka murmured worriedly, nibbling on her rice. That was super stressful yesterday. Tell me about it. Gyro sighed heavily. I was second to last, after all. I can only imagine how you felt, Midoriya-san. Asui mentioned, looking at her fellow Greenette curiously. Any reason why Aizawa-sensei singled you out yesterday? You got first on the practical, so I was confused by that. Yes, I was curious about that myself, actually. Ada admitted. Siro and Gyro also looked at him curiously. Right, you guys had already left by then. Midoriya recalled. Well, I explained to Yamomo, Yuraka-chan, Pony, and Takage-san yesterday that Aizawa-sensei was likely just testing me to make sure I wasn't too reliant on my shield. Your shield? Gyro questioned. I thought your quirk was an enhancement type, Kiro. Asui said, touching her chin in confusion. Ida perked up in recollection. Ah, oh, yes, that support item you were carrying around during the practical exam. The silver disc. The very same. Midoriya nodded, and then looked back at his classmates. I used it to take out practically all of my targets in the exam in case you were both wondering. Wait, how? Sarah looked confused. It's just a shield, right? Far from it. 
Sunatori spoke up excitedly. I only got to see him briefly use it during the exam. But Midoriya's shield is so cool. It tore through those robots like nothing. And the way he was throwing it was awesome too. It was like a boomerang the way it kept coming back to him. That declaration caught Yuraka and Yegarazu's attention. From the way Tsunotori described Midoriya's shield, it operated similarly to a certain historical figure's support item they both looked up to. Was their friend holding out on them? Curious. Yegarazu looked at Midoriya pointedly. He showed his shield to me and Yuraka chan one time. Yet we never got to see him use it. She sounded mildly annoyed, even though we kept pestering him to show us. Yuraka added, equally peeved, Please stop giving me those looks. Midoriya sweat dropped. He then chuckled awkwardly. I just want to surprise you both with it. I should have the opportunity soon since we have field class every weekday. Huh. Didn't know shields could be used that way. Siro said offhandedly. Yuraka chuckled. What? Never heard of Captain America. Sounds familiar, I think. Wasn't he just an old American hero or something? Siro cocked a brow. He was the world's first officially recognized pro-hero, Siro-san. Asui answered plainly. You should really brush up on your history. That's common knowledge, Kiro. Haha, <laughs> yeah, sorry. He rubbed his head awkwardly. Didn't pay much attention in history classes, I guess. Didn't think it was really important. Knowing history is important, even for pro-heroes. Ada seriously added, adjusting his glasses. After all, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it and those who do learn from history are doomed to watch others repeat it. Midoriya murmured to himself. Yeyorazu and Yuraka, however, overheard him and glanced at him curiously. An odd thing for him to say, they both thought. Takaj laughed and slapped Ida on the back, flustering the taller student. Geez, you need to loosen up a little, Yano, Ada-san. It's not healthy to stay so stiff all the time. I am not stiff. Ada spluttered. Yeah, you kind of are, man. Siro countered. Stiff as a rod, actually. Yep. Gyro nodded. And it's only our second day knowing you too. Asui added. Ada seemed to be flabbergasted by this revelation. I wouldn't stress about it, Ada-san. Midoriya spoke up. You're just earnest and deliberate. Nothing wrong with that. Still, he smiled slyly. You could stand to ease up a little. This isn't the military, after all. The table chuckled at that remark while Ada hung his head as if he were seriously contemplating his new friend's advice. To him, it sounded oddly similar to what his older brother Tensei kept telling him. I say that, but, Midoriya glanced around the table at his classmates. We're in the hero course, and we are essentially being trained to one day fight villains, and how to handle disaster and rescue operations. So, in a way, it is similar to military training in a sense. After the intermission concluded, Class 101 went to their final class of the day, the practical portion of the foundational heroics class. The class met up in the same classroom as their regular heroics room for brief introductions to the day's activity. Officially, nearly any pro hero employed by UA could teach the class since one of them could be called for a crisis elsewhere, and the schedules had to be flexible. When is the instructor going to show up? Yuraka whispered to Midoriya as they took their adjacent seats. Midoriya glanced at the clock. It should be any minute now. Come on, Tashinori. It's 1529. You'd already be late by military standards. Midoriya inwardly remarked. Maybe I jumped the gun on comparing this place to the military. The moment the clock shifted to 15.30, the classroom door suddenly slammed open. I am here. A familiar voice rang out, coming through the door like a normal person. Midoriya playfully rolled his eyes. He has to make an entrance, doesn't he? No way. Kaminari exclaimed with a huge grin. All Might is really our teacher. Kirishima yelled excitedly. Sweet. Takage smirked. This is gonna be so rad. Midoriya feigned a look of surprise at All Might's appearance not wanting to act too discreet to possibly arouse suspicion from others. He was amused at the mostly odd and surprised reactions from his classmates, including Yuraka, Yeyurazu, and Ponies. Yuraka was grinning widely. Pony stared in astonishment, and Yeyurazu, though outwardly subdued, had a glimmer in her gray eyes from seeing the number one hero in person. Oh wow, he's wearing his Silver Age costume. Sunatori murmured in awe. I know, so retro. Yuraka whispered, equally amazed. Midoriya chuckled to himself, he couldn't blame them for their reactions. All Might was the greatest hero in Japan, and arguably the world, so, the fact that they'd be learning from him was incredible. Midoriya internally compared it to learning heroics from Superman since that was essentially All Might's role in this world. Also, the Verdet inwardly admitted that he had been awestruck as well when he had first met All Might last year. However, with all the training and time they spent together, he had come to see Yagi as a friend rather than a celebrity. All Might, wearing his older Silver Age costume, complete with flowing cape, despite there not being any wind, marched dramatically to the front of the class and turned to face the students, fists on his hips. Remember, students, a flashy entrance is a great way to display confidence and reassure people that everything is going to be okay. 
All Might gave his trademark smile at the class. Now, then, welcome to the practical portion for Foundational Heroics 101. This is the class that gives you a taste of what being a hero in the field is like. Today, we'll be getting right into the thick of things with this. He proclaimed while pulling a card out from nowhere, which had the word battle on it in bright, red letters. Fight training. Bakugo grinned viciously. More than a few students got particularly excited. Looks like my hunch was right. UA doesn't mess around. Still, we're really doing combat training right off the bat. Midoriya felt uncertain. Yes, a battle trial. All Might grinned. But if you're going to train to be heroes, you need to look the part. He pressed a button on a remote. And then several long panels slid out from the wall with large metal briefcases numbered from 1 to 20. For that, you'll need these. Costumes. Most of the class exclaimed with a cheer. Exactly. All Might smiled. In accordance with the quirk registry and equipment request forms that you filled out before school started, even the students less enthusiastic about fighting began to get excited. After all, they'd all had at least some input in how their costumes were made, so these outfits were theirs. Yuraraka and Yeyurazu were especially thrilled. Not only did they get to show Midoriya their own costumes after his invaluable input into their designs, but they would finally see what he had done for his costume after he had kept them both in the dark for the last few weeks. All right. All Might clapped his hands together. Despite the casual gesture, there was still a small shockwave that sent everyone rocking back in their seats. Grab your costumes and head to Ground Beta when you're all suited up. Yes sir. The class responded. This is so awesome. Kirishima cheered loudly. I know, right. Ashido bounced up to him, unable to contain her giddiness. I can't wait. There was a mad dash as everyone headed to the suitcases. Though each had a large number, there was also a small tag with names attached. Much to Bakugo's anger, Midoriya's case had the number one on it, unlike the others. Behind Midoriya's silver case against the compartment wall was a black circular bag with the number one imprinted on it too. He smiled, knowing exactly what was inside. Well, old girl, let's show him our new look. At ground beta, one of the mock cityscapes used during the practical exam, All Might stood outside a tunnel as the 101 students started to emerge from it. His smile grew wider as they stepped out into daylight. They say the clothes make the pros, young ladies and gentlemen, and behold, you are the proof. The class trotted out in their respective hero costumes, some commenting on the other's suits while some maintained a quiet, focused attitude. All Might nodded in approval. Everyone looked so cool. He had a good feeling about this year's group of freshmen. He then noticed a certain student was missing from the crowd. Odd. What's holding up young Midoriya? He's been keeping me in suspense about his new costume for weeks now. Not even Carlson would give me a hint. Damn secret agent. Meanwhile, the men's locker room door slammed open as Midoriya bolted out. It had taken him slightly longer to finish putting on his uniform than the other guys, much to his chagrin. Shield doesn't disappoint. The uniform feels sturdy yet flexible in all the right places. It's pretty breathable too, Midoriya internally noted. They could have made getting into it easier though. He'd just have to be faster suiting up in the future. As he ran, he quickly glanced down at his uniform. I'll always be attached to red, white, and blue. But I really like how this came out in the end. He then recalled a scene from several weeks ago during his design process. Midoriya sat at his work desk sketching away in one of his notebooks. Designing a new uniform for the UA Hero course was more challenging than he thought. He wanted to initially base it off of his frontline suit, but quickly realized two potential issues with that. 1. Wearing anything star-spangled related could risk blowing his cover. 2. Even if his cover wasn't blown, it may be seen as cheap and uncreative on his part to copy Captain America's look, fanboy or not. Midoriya wasn't one to give up though as he pushed his enhanced mind further to brainstorm ideas, and even searched online for inspiration. Finally, after several hours of consideration, he believed he had a design ready. Let's see. Muted colors. Check. Utility belt. Check. Combat boots and gloves. Check. Midoriya put his pencil down and keenly examined his drawing and smiled. Yeah, I think this looks good. A cool alternative to what I would have worn. The darker colors make it perfect for stealth-related operations. His eyes widened at that thought. A stealth suit. He quickly took his pencil and wrote stealth suit in English at the top of the page. Nice. I think I might have. Midoriya paused as Yeyurazu and Yuraraka's words from yesterday's lunch echoed through his mind. Even as a tribute, basing any costume design off the captain's is not something to take lightly. Most heroes try to stay away from anything too similar to his costume to avoid the comparison. Hmm. Midoriya held his chin contemplatively as he reevaluated his design. Now that I think about it, this may still be too similar to my old suit. I should avoid having American colors in it, just to play it safe. But what can I replace them with? The Verdette glanced around his room for any possible alternatives. In his closet, he caught a glimpse of one of his dress shirts, specifically, its coloring. At that moment, his eyes lit up in inspiration. 
That's it. Flipping over to a blank page, Midoriya quickly began sketching. I can keep the same basic look from the stealth suit. Just change up the main colors. Add this touch here. And here. He moved to his computer and pulled up an online color picker and, after finding the exact color codes he had in mind, he filled out his design with the appropriate descriptions and specs. Moments later, the Verdette placed his pencil down and looked over the page with a satisfied smile. I think we have a winner. Hopefully Tashinori, Yamomo, and Yuraka-chan will like it too. After finishing recalling the scene, he could see the light at the end of the tunnel. This is it. My first real uniform in this era. The 21st century super soldier finally dashed into daylight. Or, as they call it these days, my hero costume. He had adorned a full-body utilitarian-looking suit that was mostly dark green with black stitching and blackish-green angular patterns on his thighs and torso. The suit's material was a Kevlar-based ballistic component that gave the suit the appearance and function of a military black ops uniform. He wore a pair of thick, dark red combat boots that ended just under his knees with three straps and black soles. Built into the suit were knee pads and elbow guards that matched the rest of his suit. A thin white stripe with a red outline stretched along the outside of his legs up to his waist, which sported a dark red leather utility belt with several pouches and loops with a few carabiners, followed by a pair of matching red leather tactical gloves on his hands. Attached to the right side of his belt was a dark green, Kevlar-based helmet that matched his suit. In the middle of his chest was a 3D5 pointed white star with a thin red outline and red segmented lines that connected to a red circle in the center. Running horizontally across his chest were three big white stripes, and the top two stripes lead to a small white ring on both shoulders that had a five-pointed star within them. Strapped to his shoulders was a red leather harness connected to a magnetic alloy on his back, with the newly painted shield attached to it. The shield's new look shared the same basic design as the original with the colors and star design altered to match the new uniform. The outer ring was a muted dark green, the middle ring was white, and the third ring was cyan. At the center was the same star design that was on his chest, primarily white with a red outline and red segments to give it a 3D look that connected to a red circle in the center. The star was contained within a dark green circle that matched the main color of his suit. Midoriya smiled confidently. Overall, he was pleased with how his new uniform turned out. All Might's grin somehow grew even wider. So cool. He inwardly gushed, paying homage to his past while embracing a new future. The greens will also help maintain his cover. Great work, Captain. Yeyarazu and Yuraka were standing together when Midoriya exited the tunnel and were blown away by his uniform, both gasping in amazement. Now that we're all present, follow me to the observation room, and we can get to the lesson. All Might began leading the class down the roadway toward a main building center. Wow, Midori-kun. Yuraka smiled brightly. Yuraka's costume was a black and pink bodysuit that did nothing to hide her curves, with large pink boots and pink wrist guards with thick circle handles. Around her curvy waist was a two-piece pale pink belt with a dark pink disc in the center. On various areas of her boots and wrist guards were dark pink circular nozzles. Her head was protected by a pink helmet that had a darkened visor curving downward with a thin pink choker around the base of her throat and neck. Only her hands were completely exposed. She practically bounced up to him, and Midoriya wondered if she added springs to her costume's boots but was distracted as other parts of her were bouncing too. Stop it, soldier. He chided himself. Control yourself. I love your costume. Yuraka beamed at him. Her boots brought her eyes level with his chin. It looks so cool dot 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 and practical too. Gee thank you. He stammered. So skin tight. Still, she looks really good in it. He felt the heat rising in his cheeks. So, this is the costume you were designing. Yeyarazu stepped up beside the brunette, keenly analyzing his suit from top to bottom. As she did so, Midoriya's inappropriate thoughts regarding Yuraka's costume were immediately replaced by Yeyarazu. The Ravenette was obviously gorgeous, and though her costume wasn't as revealing as her initial design, it still showcased her curves and a fair amount of skin. The display was enough to turn his face a deeper shade of red. Her costume consisted of a modified red and black sports bra that covered her breasts, neck, and shoulders, which included a zipper to hold it closed and left the majority of her back exposed. Her stomach was fully exposed from under the top down to her hips. She had donned a pair of tight, red shorts that went down just above her mid-thigh and had a yellow utility belt stitched into them that allowed her to carry various items. Red armor covered the top of her hands and forearms and were connected to elbow pads. On her left forearm's armor was a built-in touchscreen device that held all the information Yeirazu currently had in her dictionary on elements and compounds. On her feet was a pair of red standard sole boots that went just up to her knees, as well as red shin and knee guards for added protection. Wow, her costume came out great. Midoriya quickly averted his eyes so he wouldn't be caught staring. Yeirazu then smiled brightly, her gray eyes sparkling. I love it. It's practical and has a militaristic look and pays proper tribute to the captain without fully copying his look. 
She tapped the 3D star symbol on his chest. The red circle inside the star was a nice touch, paying homage to both your Japanese heritage and American upbringing. The shades of green suit you quite well, too. Excellent work, Midori-kun. T thanks, you too. I think both of your costumes look great. Midoriya smiled, barely able to keep himself from stuttering. He wouldn't be surprised if his head was emitting steam right now. Yeyarazu blushed cutely. You completely redesigned mine, so I have you to thank for that. I really appreciate your input into my costume too. Although, Yuraka bashfully rubbed her head, I should have been a bit more specific. It ended up being a little too skin tight. Not really my style. Nah, I think it looks great on you, Yuraka san Takage grinned as she walked up to the trio. In fact, all three of you look awesome. Her costume consisted of a purple, scaly mask over her eyes in addition to a simple bodysuit with a matching design and black knee-high boots. She wore finger gloves with orange, three-piece wrist guards, and a belt around her waist with what looked to be a jewel embedded into the center. It did very little to hide her curvy feminine figure and, at that moment, Midoriya wished he included a mask to his uniform to cover his reddening face. Why did his female friends have to be so attractive? Before he could respond, another familiar voice called out. Hey, guys. Midoriya smiled when he saw Tsunotori running up to them. Your costumes look great. Tsunotori's hero costume resembled a jockey uniform, consisting of a pale orange skin-tight shirt with paler markings around her chest and stomach with matching colored pants, along with a pair of fingerless gloves. Around her head was a horse halter with a lead rope dangling from the back. She wore belts secured around her collarbone, biceps, and lower torso, and boots that not only guarded her hooves but also had stirrups attached on either side. Thankfully for Midoriya's sake, her costume was more conservative compared to his other female friends. But he'd admit Pony still looked cute in it. Thanks, Tsunotori-san. Takage grinned. You're not looking bad yourself. Yeah, Midoriya nodded with a smile. It really matches your quirk and appearance. I love it. T thanks. The blonde pony girl smiled bashfully. Although is the halter purely for aesthetics, or is it actually functional? Midoriya offhandedly wondered. Meanwhile, Minda had been watching as the four girls gathered around Midoriya and, needless to say, he was fuming with envy. That bastard's already forming his own harem. He then lashed out. Hey, jerk. Save some for the rest of us. Oh, without warning. One of Gyro's earlobes jammed into Minda's ear and unleashed sound waves that reverberated throughout his body, temporarily stunning him. Shut up. She growled. Finally, the class walked into a dimly lit monitoring room with screens lining a wall. All right, it's time to get started ya bunch of newbies. Gather around and listen up. Everyone gathered in front of the number one hero, giving him their undivided attention. Then, much to Midoriya's amusement, All Might pulled out a notebook to read from. Is he seriously reading from a script? He tried to suppress a laugh. Before we begin, a little wisdom for when you're in the field. While the more sensationalized hero events happen in the open, the truly dangerous villains will actually be indoors. This is because a home base gives them ample time to carry out their nefarious deeds, and they know the layout, while the heroes generally don't. Midoriya nodded in agreement. Very true. Most wouldn't ever consider that fact. The scenario is this, All Might explained. Villains are hiding a nuclear weapon in a building. The heroes have located the base and must either subdue the villains or disarm the weapon within 15 minutes. Sounds like a classic action movie setup. Midoriya realized something. Wait, how are action movies done these days with quirks added to the mix? Are they essentially superhero movies without saying they're superhero movies? How will teams be chosen? Yeda asked quickly. Are there any other conditions for victory? Yeyurazu inquired next. Can I just blow them up? Bakugo demanded irritably. Do we have to worry about expulsion like yesterday? Yuraka worriedly asked, Doesn't my cape look magnifique? Ayama flamboyantly inquired, Hold on, hold on. All Might raised up his hands towards the students. I wasn't finished talking yet. The number one hero proceeded to pull out a box from off to the side. We'll be determining teams through lots. You'll all be divided into teams of two. Half of you will be heroes, the other half will be villains. Eater raised his hand as All Might pulled out a box. All Might Sensei, is such a randomization really the best way to do this? Actually, that makes sense, Midoriya spoke up. In a crisis, many heroes team up with whoever is available, and they usually don't have very long to plan. His thoughts suddenly drifted to the sludge villain incident, specifically, the pro heroes who were present then, where they'll just hang back till someone comes and does their job for them. Exactly, young Midoriya. All Might gave him a thumbs up. Drawing lots is a good way to simulate the fluid nature of a dangerous scenario. Ah, I understand. It about. Thank you both for the explanation. Not at all. That's why. All Might chuckled to himself. I am here. Some of the class laughed at his play on his famous phrase, while others groaned. As for conditions of victory, the heroes win if they can touch the weapon or if they can wrap this capture tape around the villains. 
The large blonde man informed as he showed the class a roll of capture tape. The villains win by maintaining control of the weapon or using their own capture tape on the heroes. Do know that this is still a training exercise. If I say the match is over, it is over. He left no room for argument. Any use of force that could severely injure or potentially kill another student will be an immediate disqualification and a disciplinary write-up. If you get two of those in a semester, that's grounds for removal from the hero course. Three will see you expelled from UA University altogether, so follow instructions. The crowd nodded in understanding while Bakugo was trying to suppress an annoyed groan. That being said, I do ask you to treat this as a real battle. We do have the best healer in the country via Recovery Girl on standby, so don't worry too much about inflicting injuries. Also, you don't have to worry about failure. You won't get expelled or anything like that. The class breathed a sigh of relief. He then followed up. That being said, these matches will be recorded and sent to your foundational heroics instructor, so I'd advise you not to slack off. The class promptly stiffened again. No one had planned on slacking but knowing that Aizawa was going to see their matches was enough to light a fire under everyone. With that, let's draw. He declared. What about my cape? Ayama sweat dropped, feeling left out. One by one the students came up to the box. Time, Takage and Asui Team B, Yuraka and Yeyurazu Team C, Kaminari and Gyro Team D, Takoyami and Minda Team E, Ayama and Ashido, Team F, Sato and Kota Team G, Kirishima and Siro Team H, Todoroki and Shoji Team I, Midoriya and Tsunotori Team J, Bakugo and Ida Alright. Yuraka grinned widely, walking beside her taller Ravenet friend. Looks like you and I are partners, Yamomo. Yeyurazu nodded, smiling happily. Yes, this will certainly be a fun learning experience. Sunotori jumped over toward Midoriya excitedly. We're on the same team, Izuku. What are the chances? I know. Crazy, right? Midoriya lightly chortled. Glad to be working with you, Pony. Same here. The Pony girl adopted an excited, determined smile. What do you say we kick some butt out there? She eagerly held out her fist. American style. Midoriya confidently grinned and fist bumped her back. Right. Both Yuraka and Yeyurazu observed this exchange and looked away, crossing their arms over their chests and puffing their cheeks out in frustration at how cordial they were being with one another. Why does that bother me so much? They simultaneously thought. All Might spoke up. Now, normally, I'd have the matches be randomized as well, but you all took a bit too long getting changed, so we have less time than I'd like. Let that be a lesson for the future. Anyway, the heroes will be teams A, C, E, G, and I, while the villains will be teams B, D, F, H, and J will be starting in order, so teams A and B, head on out to your assigned building. The blonde titan paused to look at his notebook. Ah, your building will have the villain's letter on the side. Remember, no inflicting serious injury to your opponents, but keep in mind that this is supposed to imitate a real crisis, so I encourage the villain teams to act the part. Speaking of which, I should mention that the villain team will have 10 minutes to get used to their base and to place their bomb, and then both sides will get 5 minutes to create a plan. After that, you have 15 minutes before the bomb goes off. Good luck. Meanwhile, Bakugo turned his gaze to a certain verdette across the room when he realized that he'd be fighting him in the final match. Perfect. This will be my chance to prove who's truly number one. He sneered. I'm gonna enjoy roasting you, Stealth Gaijin. Teams and B promptly left the monitoring room and entered Ground Beta, one of UAS Mox Cityscapes for training purposes. Outside the entrance was a table where both teams picked up blueprints for the building, earbud communicators, and rolls of capture tape. Yeyurazu and Yuraka walked into a multi-story office building with the letter B painted on the front, and quickly made their way up to the room that had their faux bomb. While they had been reassured that their time limit wouldn't start until they reacted, they didn't want to take too much advantage of the small window they had. That didn't stop them from opening a few doors along the way and taking stock of the items skewed about. Lots of nice heavy office furniture in some of these rooms, Yuraka pointed out, and some construction equipment too. Yeyurazu nodded. Yes, we should have plenty of items to work with, she said while examining the overall layout of the building compared to the blueprint she held, meaning I won't have to waste as many of my lipids on creating obstacles. With how narrow these halls are, there are plenty of choke points we could exploit if we set up barricades and traps. Yay Arazu paused, considering the idea further. But, would that even be effective on Takage and Asui? Speaking of plenty to work with, we should probably go over what gear our costumes have, Yamomo. Yuraka motioned to the numerous pouches on Yeyarazu's yellow utility belt around her shorts. Oh, yes, I didn't consider that. Well, I'm not carrying anything too fancy. Mainly basic first aid supplies such as bandages, painkillers, cut ointment, and sutures. I have capture tools as well, a net, nylon cord, folding cuffs, and marbles to throw on the floor to trip up opponents. Additionally, I also have a compact satellite phone for communication, but that's not relevant in this scenario. 
These are items I'd prefer to have on me in case I'm running low on lipids. Uraraka nodded. Sounds like a good field setup. What about you, Uraraka chan Well, I added all the stuff Midori-kun recommended. These, Uraraka motioned to the nozzles on her boots and wrist guards. Will shoot pressurized air to give me thrust when I use my quirk on myself. I can control it from my helmet. She then tapped the wrist guards. There are gyroscopes in here in my boots to give me better control in the air. It should work in theory at least. Still haven't tested it out yet. Yeirazu smiled at this information. You've certainly opened yourself up to many possibilities, Yuraka chan Couldn't have done without you guys. Yuraka chuckled. It's funny, y'all know. This morning you and Midori-kun were joking about me as an evil doctor. And now we're both on the villain team today. Yeirazu giggled. Yes, crazy coincidence, I must say. So, stupid question probably. Do you think the bomb is real? Yuraka asked, a hint of nervousness in her voice. Yeirazu shook her head. No, I highly doubt UA would endanger students by placing them near an armed bomb. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yuraka replied hesitantly. Although, we did have to fight dangerous robots in the entrance exam. And don't forget about how crazy the All-Star Games were last year. Yeirazu paused and, after a moment, realized that Yuraka made two valid points. Her confident demeanor began to falter slightly. I, I'm almost positive it's fake. It has to be. She exclaimed, unsure. Yue wouldn't do something so reckless, right? The Ravenette and Brunette finally reached the room with the faux bomb, which was a three-meter tall black rocket with red pinstripes. Yeirazu carefully approached the object and tapped her knuckles against it and smiled. It's fine, Yuraka chan It's just paper mash. Yuraka sighed in relief. That's good. Guess I got too paranoid there. It would have made things even more stressful if we actually had to worry about guarding a real bomb. Haha. <laughs> Yes, it would, with that. Yeirazu was suddenly struck by inspiration. She looked down while holding her chin in contemplation. Isui-san and Takage are both incredibly mobile and flexible. If they're both in the same room as the weapon, it'll be nigh impossible to guard it, especially against Takage's quirk. She looked up at the weapon. Maybe if we... Hmm. Looking back, Yuraka waited a few seconds before asking, Yamomo, yeah, do you have a plan? A short moment later, Yeirazu nodded and looked up with a small grin. Yes, I believe I do but we need to prepare quickly. Earlier, as soon as the teams left the room, All Might pressed a button on the keyboard behind him that revealed camera footage from both inside and outside Team B's fake hideout. I'm about to start the match soon. All of you pay close attention. All Might instructed. You'll be learning by observing as well. Midoriya already had a notebook pulled out from a pouch on his belt and was scribbling furiously. This was a great opportunity to catalog how his friends and classmates used their quirks in combat scenarios. It also put him in the right mindset to strategize against Bakugo and Ida in the final round. He could feel the blonde drilling holes into his head from the back of the room. Seriously, what was his problem? So, Kirishima broke the sudden silence. Who do you think will win this match? Well, Takage san is very mobile when she splits herself up, and has many options for attacking, Midoriya said to himself while riding. Asui-san is perfect for scaling walls and her jumping ability is impressive. Overall, they're a quick, mobile team. On the other hand, Yamomo's quirk is incredibly versatile as she can make practically anything, meaning she can adapt to almost any situation. Yuraka chan can make herself float or anything else around her she can touch and could maneuver items around as makeshift barricades or use them as ammunition. Midoriya raised an eyebrow as he thought. The villains will want to keep the hero team as far away from the bomb as possible. If either Takage san and Urasui san are in the same room with the bomb, it'll be practically impossible to defend given how mobile the heroes are. This matchup is honestly going to come down to how well the villain team can play defense, and I would say they certainly have the advantage in this scenario. It took Midori a moment to realize that everyone, even All Might, was staring at him. Uh, what? Your analytical mind is as impressive as always, Captain? All Might mused. Izuku, Pony looked at him. Wide-eyed, did you really come up with all that off the top of your head? Oh, um, yeah. He replied, feeling a bit embarrassed. It's a hobby of mine. As sorry. No need for apologies, young Midoriya. All Might walked over to clap him on the shoulder. On the fly analysis of someone's abilities is good for gauging how to fight against a villain or alongside a hero. He turned back to the screen. With that analysis in mind, what odds would you put on the heroes winning? Hmm, not good, All Might Sensei. He shrugged. This type of scenario favors whoever's playing defense, and that's something the villain team can do very well between Yamomo and Yuraka chan The heroes will have to be fast and hope they get past whatever barriers and traps the villains have set up before the clock runs down, or getting captured. Where do you think the bomb will be? Asui asked while looking over the building's blueprints. Well, the top floor seems like the most logical place, Takage replied. 
But Yamomo is too smart to do that. Also, they already know I can fly, and you can jump and stick to walls, Asui-san, so it'd be pointless to put it up there. Please, call me Tsuyu, Asui requested, and I agree. They'll likely put the bomb somewhere else, probably the third or fourth floor, Kiro. Asui's hero costume reflected her appearance in Quirk, Frog, very well. It was a green bodysuit with black and yellow stripes, and the shoes had been designed to look like a frog's feet. She also had large white gloves, and large goggles on her forehead reminiscent of a frog's eyes. She might have had a blank expression and hunched posture, but with her costume, it was kind of cute. That's assuming they could even move it to begin with. Takage mentioned, With your Uraka's quirk, I think they could easily, if it's not too big to fit through the doors. That was a good point, Asui admitted. So, what do you think we should do? She looked up at the building, tapping a finger against her chin. Takage crossed her arms over her chest, adopting a thoughtful expression. Yamomo can create any inorganic material as long as she knows its molecular properties and has the lipids to make it. Your Uraka can remove an object's gravity, but she has to touch said object. With all that in mind, it's likely they'll barricade themselves in whatever room the bomb's in. And since we don't how big the bomb is, it could potentially be in any of the other smaller rooms too. You don't think they'll come after us? Asui inquired curiously. Takage shook her head. Coming after us would open them up to getting captured. Staying with the bomb and running out the clock is the best strategy on their part. Asui considered Takage's logic and nodded in agreement. With Yegarazu's quirk, close-range combat wasn't necessary on the villain's part when she could just create practically any weapon or material for a trap. Also, with her and Takage's respective quirks, they'd want to keep them as far away from the bomb as possible. Makes sense. You could fly to the top floor and work your way down, while I work my way up. That could cut our time searching in half, Kiro. Masui suggested. Come, Takage briefly considered the idea, then shook her head. No, I'd rather not risk one of us falling into any potential traps Yamomo may have set up dot 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 or a two-on-one fight. We're already at a disadvantage as it is. If that's the case, searching could drain more time off the clock. Asui pointed out. That's right. So, Takage grinned, we go in fast and hot. Cross off each floor one at a time. Once we find them guarding the bomb, we attack immediately. Don't give them a chance to counter or regroup. Yamomo needs time to create objects, and the more complex they are, the more she'll need. I'll surround her with most of my body pieces and overwhelm her. If I see a chance, I'll touch the bomb with one of them, securing us the victory. Hiro, Iraka has to touch what she wants to make float. So, if I stick to the walls and keep jumping around her, she won't be able to use her quirk on me. Asui nodded, and looked over at her fellow Greenette. All the basics of the plan seemed solid enough. If I get a chance, I'll touch the bomb too. Takage nodded, smirking confidently. Looks like we got ourselves a plan then, Suyu. Tima you are free to enter the building. Your time starts now. All Might's voice rang through the pause system. Let's go. Takage eagerly yelled. Tiro. As planned, the Greenette duo entered the building through the first floor. Takage took the lead by splitting her arms, legs, and torso apart and levitating in the air. Asui wasn't far behind as she clung to the walls. In a very short time, they were able to find and clear the rooms. There was no evidence that Yeyurazu or Yuraka were lying in wait for them or had even been on the floor. The two proceeded up the stairway to the second floor, with Takage flying and Asui jumping between the walls of the stairwell in case the stairs themselves were booby-trapped in some way. They continued their search pattern while remaining cautious of any surprise attacks. Like the first floor, they found no signs of the bomb or the villains. Though they were quick and methodical, several minutes had already passed and there were still three more floors to check. We'll need to pick up the pace, Kiro, Asui said as she jumped out of an empty office. Otherwise, we'll run out the clock before we reach the top floor. Takage nodded. Right, can't afford to be too cautious now. Maybe I should just check the top floor and work my way down to meet Suyu in the middle. Takage briefly pondered, but then shook her head. No, we have a plan and can't abandon it at the drop of a hat. We'll find the bomb soon. They continued up the stairwell and opened the door to the third floor and immediately spotted Yeyarazu and Yuraka standing down the hallway. However, unlike the previous two floors, the corridor was littered with construction equipment, office desks, chairs, and miscellaneous supplies from the adjacent office rooms. Did they set all of this up? Takage wondered. Yeyarazu looked up from the touchscreen on her forearm, shooting the pair a condescending smirk. It's about time you showed up, heroes. It's impolite to keep a lady waiting. They're not hiding in the room with the bomb. Asui questioned. Hiding? In our own lair. Preposterous. Yeyarazu chuckled smugly, resting a hand on her hip. Why would we ever hide when our victory is assured? Yuraka looked away, trying to contain her giggles. She's really getting into it. Takage rejoined her body parts in order to reset her quirk's timer, looking at the pair oddly. Wait, why wouldn't they barricade themselves with the bomb? It makes no sense. Yeyarazu continued. 
I wish to destroy the world and recreate it in my image. She pointed at the other team. I won't let foolish heroes such as you foil my plans for a better tomorrow. PFFT. Hiroraka broke out into a giggling fit. She's so serious. Takage, look past them. Asui pointed ahead. Takage looked where Asui was directing her attention toward. Past Yeirazu and Yuraka. There was much more debris strewn about the floor that got denser and more compact the closer it got to a large double door. They're making an effort to block off that door. Takage inwardly noted. That door leads to an interior room, if I recall the layout correctly. No other way to get inside it. Her eyes widened in realization. You think. Noticing that their opponent's attention had shifted, Yuraka and Yeirazu both closed ranks and blocked the door from their view. Takage smirked roguishly. Could I, sue you? That door's the only way into that room. The bomb's definitely in there. Asui nodded. How do we get past them? Bullrush them, obviously. Takage split her arms and legs from her torso and levitated. If even one of us gets past them, we can get to the bomb and win. Not exactly the cleverest solution. No time to be clever. Let's just win this. Takage's voice carried down the hallway as her body parts shot forward. Yuraka touched her fingers together, making herself weightless. You ready, Yamomo? Yes. The Ravenet nodded. Just remember the plan. Don't let anyone get past you. With Takage's declaration, Asui jumped onto the wall and began to bounce from one side of the corridor to the other, crisscrossing the blocked floor. Yuraka watched her closely, timing how quickly she was jumping around. Using her visor's heads-up display, pressurized air discharged from Yuraka's boots and sent her flying forward. She swung her feet up, the gyroscope spinning hard, reorienting upward to the ceiling. She had timed her jump so that her feet collided directly with Asui, sending the greenette tumbling back. The frog girl stuck herself onto the ceiling to prevent herself from falling. Yuraka's landing was not much better as she was forced to tuck and roll after getting thrown off kilter from the collision. They work like a charm. Still, she said to herself, gonna need to practice some more with them. Regaining her bearings, Yuraka launched herself at Asui, but was smacked hard across the head by the frog girl's tongue. OOF. Asui didn't let up and struck Yuraka two more times before the brunette successfully dodged the third strike. When Asui tried to go for a fourth, Yuraka brushed four of her fingers against the long appendage, her pinky barely missing it. The greenette immediately retracted her tongue and changed her tactics by wrapping it around a filing cabinet and throwing it at Yuraka. Shoot, Yuraka narrowly jumped out of the way, giving Asui an opening to get past her. However, the gravity girl quickly closed it by landing on the floor and floating two desks. So, you want to throw things, huh? Kiro, Asui jumped back as the first desk cut off her path, and then went to the other wall as the second desk hit where she had been, shattering a window and floating outside before slamming into a building across the street. Yuraka backpedaled and picked up more items within her reach, chucking them at Asui who either jumped around to avoid them or was able to kick or catch it with her tongue to launch it back. Dang it, Asui-san. Stay still, will you? Call me Tsuyu. Oh, right. Sorry. Asui watched as Yuraka stopped her bombardment and shot air from her boots to launch herself forward at Asui. As she did, the keen frog girl noticed that a sizable amount of clutter that had been previously blocking the far end of the hall was gone. Yuraka opened up the hallway. We'll have a clear shot to the room if we can get past them. Asui realized. Yuraka was halfway towards Asui when someone cried out from below. Yuraka-chan. Stop her. The brunette stopped in midair and turned to look down. Yeirazu was lying on the floor as Takage's head, torso, and leg parts went sailing toward the opening in the hall that Yuraka had opened up. Oh crap. Yuraka blasted herself toward Takage. But Asui was quick to react by wrapping her tongue around Yuraka's waist. Asui twisted and tossed her right into Yeirazu, sending both tumbling to the floor. With Yeirazu and Yuraka out of the way, Asui joined up with Takage and rushed toward the double door. Moments earlier, as Yuraka launched herself toward Asui, Yeirazu focused her attention squarely on Takage. Sorry, Yamomo. Takage shouted as she flew over the debris littering the corridor. But I'm winning this one. Yeirazu smiled confidently. We'll see about that, won't we? Her abdomen flashed with multicolored light as she pulled out a net gun. Pulling the trigger, a large net shot out and unfurled in midair. Takage's main torso managed to narrowly avoid the net, but one leg and arm were caught inside it. She tried to wiggle them out, but they were securely wrapped around the net's cords. Crap. She internally cursed, realizing she wouldn't be getting those appendages back anytime soon. I'll have to regenerate them later, but that'll take a toll on my stamina. Have to end this fast. Yeirazu's right leg briefly shone as she formed a black airsoft gun this time. Pulling it up, she aimed at her opponent and fired several rounds. The airborne greenette was quick to dodge in between the rounds, which splattered on the far end of the hallway. Really, trying to shoot me with paintballs. Takage jeered. Yeirazu smirked. Not paintballs. She fired a few more rounds and managed to hit Takage's other arm. 
The appendage fell to the floor as a yellowish-white paste instantly hardened around it. Huh? Takage glanced back, confused by her other arm being stuck. What you? An instant drying adhesive paste. Yeyarazu quickly answered. I learned the formula for that particular compound ages ago. A hint of pride was present in her voice. Yeah, well, Takage split her torso and remaining leg into several more pieces, I still got plenty of parts to spare. You can't trap all of me. She shot forward, fully intending on getting past Yeyarazu. Maybe, but I wonder though. The Ravenet genius swiped her right arm forward, instantly creating a black spherical object and tossing it forward. The object then discharged a small rust-colored haze. Takage's head passed through it and she immediately felt her eyes start to burn. A-A-R-G-H-H. She painfully cried out. What is, O-O-F? Yeyarazu formed a staff and struck Takage's main body with her head attached, sending her crashing into the wall. Apologies. That was a canister filled with Olorsin capsicum. Yeyarazu calmly explained, or to use the common term, pepper spray. Cheap shot. She spat, her eyes burning like hell. Maybe so, but it is something a villain would do. No hard feelings I hope. Yeyarazu used one hand to reach for her capture tape on her belt, intending to eliminate her opponent from the match. However, Takage had other ideas. She grinned mischievously. None at all. As Yeyarazu approached her, Takage's foot flew out of nowhere and kicked the tape out of her hands. Taken aback by the surprise move, Yeyarazu's staff was forcefully pulled from her grasp by one of Takage's hands. Where'd that hand come from? I was sure I. Her eyes widened when she noticed the arm that she had trapped an adhesive on the floor was missing its hand. How careless of me. Takage's remaining legs swept Yeyarazu off her feet, causing her to fall on her back. I can still control my body parts, blinded or not. Takage stated, fighting through the flaring pain. Takage squinted her eyes open to look around. Though her vision was blurry, she was able to make out the relatively clear path toward the double doors. This was their chance. Without saying a word, Takage soared toward the doors. Iraraka chan stop her. Yeyarazu cried out from behind her. Takage turned her head, trying to find where Yuraka would attack her from. She found the brunette just as Asui pulled her out of the air and threw her behind them. Landing beside her, Asui joined her as they rushed for the door. We need to hurry, Kiro, Asui warned. They won't stay down for long. Doesn't matter, Takage sharply replied. This match is ours. Reaching the doors, Asui and Takage yanked them open and rushed into the room. They rushed halfway inside the large space before noticing a two-meter-long and one-meter-wide silver, high-tech container lying on the floor. Hiro, is it the bomb? Asui blinked twice. It looks so real. I thought it'd be just a prop. It has to be. Come on, let's win this thing. Takage and Asui approached the device, neither noticing a red light on the side was blinking faster the closer they got. Through squinted, reddened eyes, Takage grinned widely as she touched the device with her hand. I win this one, Yeyarazu. Now we're even sti. Nothing happened. Both were confused as to why All Might wasn't declaring their victory over the PAW system. Then, click, SWWOOSH. Before they could react. The device in front of them exploded into a giant plume of yellowish-white foam that instantly expanded outward and caught Asui and all of Takage's remaining body parts in it, filling nearly half of the large room in the process. The foam instantly hardened and trapped both greenettes in it. W what the? Takage tried to move any of her parts, but they wouldn't budge. What is this? Hiro. Asui tried to pull herself out, but to no avail as she had no leverage. Can't move. Your struggles are pointless. Both turned to see Yeyarazu and Yuraka saunter into the room with proud grins on their faces. It's packaging foam. You have no leverage trapped inside of it. Yeyarazu smirked victoriously. I believe this is checkmate. Takage furrowed her brows together as she realized what had happened. Damn it. I knew it was strange that they were both in the hallway seemingly waiting for us. I was so focused on finding the bomb. I never even considered this was just a ploy. The hero team is trapped. The villain team wins. All Might's voice shouted through the speakers. Following the match, Yeyarazu created a solvent to free Asui and Takage from the packaging foam and helped the latter reclaim her body parts so she wouldn't have to regenerate them, avoiding the significant drain to her stamina. Both teams were then given quick examinations by several medical robots. After getting treated for minor bruises in addition to washing out and treating Takage's eyes from the pepper spray, both teams were given the all-clear before rejoining their classmates in the monitoring room. You guys killed it out there. Ashido exclaimed excitedly. Yeyarazu, what was all the stuff that trapped Takage and Asui? Spray foam. Yeyarazu answered. It's created by mixing two materials, isocyanate and polyol resin. It's commonly used in packaging or thermal insulation. Ha. <laughs> Ashido rubbed the back of her head sheepishly. You lost me after spray foam, but it sounded cool. That was a really creative idea. Great thinking, Yamomo. Midoriya commented making the heiress lightly blush. To think she knows how to make a bomb that deploys spray foam off the top of her head. Gamomo really is amazing. 
First of all, I want to congratulate both teams, All Might said. You both performed admirably and had good plans. But it's time to review the match. Win or lose, it is important to look back on your actions and learn from them. Now then, before the next teams go out, I'd like to hear any questions or feedback from the rest of the class. Let's start with any questions or comments for Tima first. Midoriya raised his hand and, after getting acknowledged by All Might, asked, What was your plan of attack? We didn't have audio and the video feed only started once the match had begun. Takage answered, The plan was to do a full sweep of the building. We didn't know anything about the bomb, so that left too many places it could have been hiding for us to just run in and pick at random. Actually, we never even saw the bomb. Asui turned to Yeyarazu and Yuraka. How big was it? Hiro, approximately three meters tall. Yeyarazu replied. Ugh. Takage groaned, pinching the bridge of her nose. That would have been nice to know. Could have crossed some rooms off the list. Between you and Asui-san, you both had the mobility advantage. Why not split up to cut down your search time? Tenya inquired. I didn't want to risk us falling into a trap or a two-on-one fight if it could be helped. Takage replied and then shrugged. In hindsight, that was probably the wrong decision. Not exactly. All Might interjected. As with most things in life, there is no cut and dry answer. If you had split your team up, it is likely you would have both fallen prey to a possible ambush or a trap. Then again, you could have pinpointed the bomb's location much faster and devised a plan to secure it before the timer ran down. The truth is, you never know the right answer until the end, or even if there was a right answer. After a few moments as everyone in the class thought it over, Ashido raised her hand. Well, I don't know if this is really feedback or a question, but Midoriya was right. This whole thing gives an advantage to whoever is playing defense. Hold on, Takage turned to Midoriya with a cocked eyebrow. He knew we would lose. Midoriya immediately shook his head before he elaborated. Not exactly. I just pointed out that the villain team had really good defensive options, and they had more time to prepare. Your team's strategy wasn't bad given the situation, Takage-san, but, like most plans, it just didn't survive first contact with the enemy. Most of the class shared similar sentiments with the Verdet's assessment. Excellent points, everyone. All Might stated. Now, are there any questions or comments for Team B? Several hands went up around the room, and All Might was left to decide who went first. Yung Takoyami. From the video feed, it looked like you were waiting for the hero team on the third floor. Takoyami mentioned. It was as if you knew they'd be coming from the stairs. How'd you know all that? Dark Shadow, Takoyami's living quirk, asked. Midori already had a page dedicated to Takoyami in his notebook. The idea of a sentient quirk was absolutely fascinating to him. He looked forward to learning more about his brooding classmate's quirk in the future. Dr. Hatsum would have a field day studying Dark Shadow and all the other meta abilities in this era. He thought. Meanwhile, Yeyurazu smiled as her right forearm briefly glowed, creating a little gray ball with a black lens on it. I created a few of these little cameras and had Yuraka-chan place them in strategic areas on every floor. I was able to view the live feed from my costume's tablet. Most of the class was surprised by this news, especially Takage and Asui. Wait, Jairo's eyes went wide. You mean, you know how to create a working camera off the top of your head? Um, yes. Yuraka grinned and stood by her friend. Yamomo is a genius, so figuring out how to make cameras and stuff is a piece of cake. Not gonna lie, Takage smiled, that is pretty cool, and a little unfair. Kaminari sheepishly added. The hero team had no element of surprise then. Shoji stated. Sunotori raised her hand. If the bomb wasn't on the third floor, where was it? Iroraka answered this time. We placed it in an interior room on the fourth floor. Midoriya raised his hand. If that's the case, what was your plan if the heroes had entered the building from the upper floors, or had decided to split up and work their way to the middle of the building? The class listened to what Team B's answer would be, especially Team A. Well, Yuraka chuckled bashfully. To be fair, this was all Yamomo's plan. I just followed her lead. You did well, Yuraka-chan. Give yourself credit. Yeyurazu smiled. We actually had another spray foam bomb set up behind a barricaded room on the top floor. Hiroraka chan and I would have run up the stairs in a panic to make the other team believe we were taken off guard by their decision to enter from the roof, making them believe it was the real bomb. Oh, I see. And if they touched it, they would have gotten trapped like earlier too. Sunotori pieced together. And if they had split up, Hiroraka spoke up. I would have gone up to engage whoever was coming from the top floor and lead them towards that floor's spray foam bomb, tricking them into believing I was guarding the real one. Meanwhile, Yeyurazu picked up. I would have stayed on the third floor and carried out the same tactic for our other opponent. However, I'll admit our chances of victory would have been significantly reduced if we were forced to fight on a two-way front as the risk of being captured would have been higher. Takage visibly winced at that statement. Prep. I was too cautious. I should have gone with Tsuyu's suggestion, or just changed up our strategy after clearing the second floor. We fell right into their trap. Tsuyu noticed her partner's distress and patted her shoulder reassuringly. 
It's alright, Takage san We both agreed on the plan. We live and learn. Indeed, that is the point of training. As long as you are willing, you can grow and learn from it, win or lose. All Might declared. Now, before we move on, I'd like to say that young Yeyarazu was the MVP of this match. She had the ingenious plan to successfully fool and capture two mobile opponents. Well done. Yeyarazu blushed and bowed from the praise as the rest of the class, minus Bekugo, politely applauded. All right, time for the next teams, C and D, to get ready. Takoyami and Minta were the villains, so they left first. A few minutes later, Kaminari and Jairo left to make their own plan. While that happened, Takage noticed Midoriya scribbling in his notebook. Yeyarazu, Yuraka, and Tsunotori were standing close by him. It made sense for Tsunotori to be near Midoriya since she was his teammate. But she was a little curious as to why the other two were always close to him. A question for later, she supposed. Hey, Midoriya. Takage walked over to him. Were you taking notes during the first match? Yeah, Tsunotori answered, smirking. He was taking a lot, actually. Why yeah, he sheepishly admitted, I didn't mean to offend you. It's just that I love learning about quirks and their applications. It's a hobby of mine. Relax, my fellow greenie. Takage waved off, grinning. I don't mind, really. That's good. Um, while we're waiting, do you mind if I ask you something? I saw that your costume splits apart with your body, yet it doesn't look segmented or anything. How does that work? Oh, that. It's because my costume is made of my own cells. Takage casually replied. It can regenerate alongside my parts, even if they get destroyed. Midoriya's eyes widened slightly. Wait, that's possible. Takage shrugged nonchalantly. Yeah, that kind of stuff has been around for a while now. That's pretty fascinating. Midoriya commented. Making note of that on Takage's section in his notebook, Yeirazu stopped to ponder on Takage's reply. Hold on, if that's the case, then why didn't the design company our family hire suggest something like Takage's costume? That would have been perfect for my costume before Midoriya redesigned it. I don't understand. Anything in those notes of yours on our team's performance? Anything we could have done better? Takage inquired curiously. He flipped a few pages in his book. You and Asui Sen fought well, actually. Yamomo and Yuraka-chan just had a pretty solid defense and a clever trap laid out. There's no shame in falling for it. Still, he looked up at her. I would have split up to search for the bomb given how mobile your team was. Like Yamomo said, your chances of winning would have increased if you forced them to fight on a two-way front. No offense to Yamomo and Yuraka-chan's combat skills, but between you and Asui, you likely would have captured them in most cases. Makes sense. Takage lowered her head, frowning. I actually thought of doing that after Tsuyu and I finished checking the second floor. Our time was running out, but I was too committed to the original plan, and I ended up not noticing the trap we were walking into until it was too late. Yeyurazu stepped in. Like All Might Sensei said, there's no way of knowing if your decision was right until the end, but I'd recommend being a little more flexible in your tactics going forward. Takich, she suggested earnestly. How's the saying go? If plan A fails, go to plan B Midoriya lightheartedly added. And if plan B fails, Takage raised an eyebrow. Midoriya grinned. You flee, or improvise, depending on the situation. Takage was left to ponder on that thought before she nodded in agreement. By the way, Yeyurazu continued. I apologize for the pepper spray, Takage. I hope you can forgive me. She bowed apologetically. Don't sweat it. The greenette beauty patted the heiress's shoulder reassuringly. I know it was nothing personal. You were just getting into character. Yeah, Yuraka struggled to contain her spluttering giggles. Remembering Yeyurazu's villain acting, she really was. Yeyurazu blushed in embarrassment and looked away. Feeling less depressed about her match, Takage glanced at Asui who gave her a reassuring thumbs up and nod. She wasn't down about what happened, and she certainly wasn't upset with her. However, Takage decided she would need to do better next time. Of course, if she had to face off against her classmates again, she'd have to be more prepared. Takage briefly glanced at Midoriya's notes before looking back to Yeyarazu. Hey, if it's not too much trouble, could you make me a notebook and pencil, Yamomo? I'd like to take some notes too. Not a problem, her classmate kindly replied. After creating the requested items, Takage took them and turned her full attention to the screen. She figured that she'd take a page out of Midoriya's book and take down as many notes and observations regarding her classmates' abilities as she possibly could. She had some catching up to do, after all. All of the matches went by rather quickly. The second matchup featured Kaminari and Gyro as the heroes against Takoyami and Minta as the villains. Gyro used her living earjacks to scout for their opponents and since they were on the same floor even from the minuscule sounds they involuntarily produced, just as the heroes were about to engage, they were taken off guard by dark shadow soaring in and throwing several pieces of office furniture at them, forcing them to go on the defensive. In the midst of the ambush, Minda pulled his sticky purple balls off his head and anchored the heroes to the floor, allowing Dark Shadow to swiftly wrap capture tape around Gyro. 
Kaminari panicked and unleashed a massive surge of electricity that not only electrocuted Takoyami but forced Dark Shadow to retreat back within his host. Minda was out of Kaminari's range due to using his balls to stick to a dark corner on the ceiling before he tossed more balls at Kaminari to nullify his electricity. With Kaminari subdued, Minda wrapped capture tape around the electric blonde and claimed victory for the villain team. In the end, Minda had received the award of MVP for the match due to his ability to trap the heroes and stay hidden, much to the girl's chagrin. Gyro had bowed apologetically to her female classmates for her failure while Kaminari was still feeling lightheaded from using his quirk, some of Minda's purple balls still stuck to him. Minda had tried to brag about the victory but was promptly ignored by his female classmates, much to his displeasure. Takoyami, however, remained humble and was simply pleased he could help ascertain victory for his team. The next match pitted Ayama and Ashido as the heroes against Sato and Koda as the villains. Going in, the hero team certainly held the advantage in terms of long-range capabilities and the overall destructive prowess of their quirks. However, the villain team unleashed a surprise attack that no one had seen coming. Courtesy of Koda, hordes of rats and spiders that lived throughout Ground Beta gathered inside the building and immediately swarmed the heroes, much to everyone's shock. While they were distracted, Sato ate sugar to boost his strength and punched the ground hard enough to create a small shockwave that knocked both Ashido and Ayama off their feet and into a wall, semi-conscious. In the end, the villain team had won, and Koda was declared the match's MVP. The penultimate match featuring Kirishima and Siro as the heroes with Todoroki and Shoji as the villains was by far the quickest and most one-sided. Siro used his tape to lift him and Kirishima up to the roof and enter from the top floor, but Shoji had immediately sensed them by producing extra ears. With Shoji pointing in their opponent's direction, Todoroki encased the entire top half of the building in ice and instantly trapped the hero team. Even Bakugo was visibly affected by the display of power. After unfreezing his opponents in the building, Todoroki was named the MVP while maintaining his stoic expression. Throughout all the matches, Midoriya provided running commentary. He pointed out how certain quirks had specific weaknesses that other quirks could take advantage of, but it still fell to the users in question to recognize those advantages. He also made a point of complimenting both sides after every match, praising what they did right, and pointing out how they could do better next time. Even some of the students who were less gracious in defeat were aware that Midoriya was actually giving sound advice. Though, in his excitement, he would occasionally enter his infamous mutter storms. Yeirazu and or Uraraka would have to snap him out of it, much to his embarrassment. By the time the final match had arrived, everyone noticed that Midoriya ceased his mutterings and straightened up, adopting a stern, steel-eyed expression. Even Yeirazu and Uraraka were taken aback by his sudden shift in demeanor. Um, Midori-kun, you okay? Uraraka asked. Midoriya first rolled up his notebook and returned it to a pouch on his belt before he turned to her and wordlessly nodded, not easing the brunette's concern. Hiroraka looked back to Yeirazu, who was equally concerned by this sudden shift. All right, All Might said out loud, getting the class's attention. Team J, head on out and make your plan. Team I, you know the drill by now, so just wait before entering your designated zone. Good luck to both teams. Bakugo shot Midoriya an intense glare before stalking off. Ada hot on his heels. The Verdette remained unaffected as he watched Team J leave the room. He seems to have a problem with you. Sunotori mentioned as she saw the ash blonde glare at her teammate. Do you two know each other or something? No, whatever problem he has with me doesn't matter though. Midoriya flatly replied. Let's head downstairs. I already have a plan in mind. Oh okay, Sunotori replied, surprised by how serious her partner sounded. After Team I exited the room, a moment of silence passed before Kaminari broke it. So, did anyone feel the intensity around Midoriya go from 0 to 12 in 2 seconds flat? Most of the class nodded in agreement. Geez, and I thought Ida was the tense one. Siro remarked. What was that about? He's probably just focusing on the match. Kirishima shrugged. They're going up against Bakugo and Ida. Those two are no slouches. Iroraka leaned closer to Yeirazu to converse quietly. You think that's what it is? Bakugo's been glaring hard at Midori-kun for nearly the entire class. Possibly, she whispered back, and then adopted a thoughtful look. Remember though, Midori-kun did tell us he was in the US Army. Perhaps this is his soldier training coming to light, like it did in the alley back then. Iroraka's brown eyes widened while recalling their first meeting with their friend. The same kind of look Midoriya had when he took down those high school delinquents matched the expression he had moments earlier. That's true, I didn't think about that. Iroraka replied. Ashido's eyes widened when she realized something. Hey, has anyone noticed that none of the hero teams have won today? Most of the class perked up, realizing their pink classmate had made a good observation. Kiro, Asui touched her chin cutely. I didn't realize that till now. So far, this whole scenario really has been in the villain team's favor. And this is precisely the point of this exercise, my dear students. All Might asserted. 
Real pros have to outwit villains on a daily basis, but that's life. Even when the odds are not in our favor, we fight. Most of the class smiled at All Might's statement in enthusiasm. He smiled widely and held up a clenched fist. All together, let's hear a plus ultra. The entire class shouted, some more enthusiastic than others. With all that said, students, what odds would you give Team I? The hulking blonde asked, please don't be afraid to speak your mind. This is an open forum. Everyone paused and considered All Might's question. Not good, Zero shrugged. Honestly, I'd have to pick the villain team. Same, Kaminari agreed. But Hugo's super strong, and it ascends really fast. Yeah, Team J's got some strong quirks on their side. Sato nodded. I don't want to say the heroes will lose, but it does seem like the villains have a strong advantage, Kirishima admitted. So the villain will win all of the matchups today. Jiro offhandedly noted. Hmm. Takoyami lowered his head contemplatively, shutting his eyes. A possible bad omen. A dark cloud on the horizon. He's up there, edgelord. Dark shadow sardonically remarked. Hiroraka and Yeyarazu, meanwhile, didn't appreciate how quickly the class had seemingly written off Midoriya and Tsunotori. Well, I think the hero team will win. Hiroraka strongly affirmed, gaining everyone's attention. Midori Kun's pretty strong and fast too. Plus, Tsunotori San can fly when she wants and can use her horns as weapons. He <laughs> he, Minta grinned. You could say Tsunotori's a bit horny, oh. Nobody cared enough to intervene when Asui extended her long, powerful tongue and slapped Minda across the face. I wouldn't write them off just yet either. Takage chimed in. Midoriya and Tsunotori have the mobility advantage since I doubt Ida-san can get up to full speed while confined in that building. There's one other thing all of you are also not considering. Yeyurazu added. Team Cohesion. Ashido deduced what Yeyurazu was implying. I see what you're saying. It comes down to if Bakugo-san can actually work together with Ida-san, right? An excellent observation. All Might commented, cohesion and communication are important factors for any team's success. Heroes or villains, teams that bicker amongst themselves or fail to communicate are inefficient and run the risk of suffering devastating losses. After a short moment of silence for the class to mull this information over, All Might returned his attention to the screens and brought up footage of inside and outside Team J's hideout. I'm about to start the match soon, so everyone pay close attention. Don't be dozing off just because it's the final battle for the day. All Might firmly said, Be respectful to your fellow classmates. Yes sir. The class collectively replied, I don't know if this was fate or sheer coincidence, but the best has been saved for last. All of you are about to watch a pro at work. Yagi giddily mused, trying to remain outwardly collected. As a teacher, I can't play favorites. I'll be fair in my grading, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't excited to see the captain in action, even if it's just training. Yuraraka and Yeyurazu looked at the monitors expectantly. You got this, Midori-kun. Yuraraka inwardly declared as she clenched her fists. Show that jerk who's boss. You're strong and very capable. I know you'll find a way to win this. Yeyurazu felt confident in her friend's victory. She briefly recalled how he had saved her and Yuraraka that day in the alley and smiled determinately. Show everyone what you can do. Takage flipped to a new page in her notebook, her pencil ready to note her observations on the upcoming match. Let's see what you got, number one. She grinned. Todoroki remained at the back of the crowd. His full attention was focused squarely on the screen that displayed Midoriya. And Tsunotori waiting outside the villain's hideout, talking. This match would prove whether or not the Verdette foreigner was an obstacle to his goal. Earlier. Okay, what's your plan, Izuku? Tsunotori asked in English, placing an earbud in her ear. Ada seems strong, and so does Bakugo. But we have you, right? You got first on the practical exam, and on the test yesterday. That's irrelevant, Midoriya retorted in English, making Tsunotori deflate slightly. Besides, he continued while collecting a blueprint to the villain's hideout. You shouldn't rely on me to do everything. We can still lose if we're not careful. Bakugo has shown that he's strong and fast. Ada is faster, and I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of his kicks. But you have a plan, right? Tsunotori said. Midoriya nodded. Yeah. Equipped with their earbuds and capture tape rolls, the pair proceeded down the street toward the designated hideout. Midoriya quickly memorized the building's blueprint and handed it to Pony. I noticed yesterday that Eater runs faster when he has more time and space to run. He pointed out, if we keep him from any long hallways or big open areas, he likely won't be able to run too fast. As for Bakugo, he'll be coming for me. Huh. Sunotori looked up from the blueprints, blinking in confusion. How do you know that? Fair question. He'd admitted that he didn't know Bakugo very well, if at all. Nevertheless, based on their limited interactions, Midoriya felt he had a strong enough gauge of Bakugo's personality to be certain of his assessment. He sighed in exasperation. For whatever reason, he has it out for me. 
whether it's because I beat his practical exam score, ranked first in the test yesterday, or something else entirely. It doesn't matter. He's a very prideful guy who can't stand losing. That's what I'm getting at. Sunotori, remembering the blonde's declaration to the class yesterday, nodded at that valid assessment. Plus, the guy has been practically drilling holes into my head since these matches started, he dryly noted. With all that said, I doubt that Bakugo will work with Ida on anything. He'll come after us instead of waiting. But he's not stupid, he'll probably have Ida guarding the bomb. So, here's our plan of attack, Midoriya laid out, I'll draw his attention. While he's focused on me, you fly outside and locate the weapon. Best case scenario, you fly past Ida and touch the bomb. And, if it's not that simple, Sunotori hesitantly asked, don't let Ada build up speed, Midoriya instructed. Use your horns to trip him up or ideally trap him against the floor or wall. Aim to subdue him unless you see an opening for the bomb, that's the objective. Sunotori nodded in understanding and considered Midoriya's plan. As they arrived at the building, the American pony girl noticed something. There sure are a lot of windows to check. Should I start on the ground and work my way up? Midoriya shook his head. No, top to bottom. Neither Ada nor Bakugo would leave the bomb on the first floor. They'd want to keep it far enough away that we'd have to come get it by going up the stairs. He rationalized and Tsunotori agreed with that logic. One more thing, Midoriya momentarily paused. Even though this is training. Pony, we need to treat this like a real scenario like All Might said. Let's not be reckless around the bomb and try to limit property damage as much as we can. Wouldn't be surprised if that's factored into our score. Sunotori nodded, folding up the blueprint and putting it away. Okay, that makes sense. Midori unclipped his helmet off of his belt and placed it on his head. There are thousands of people in this city, and their lives are in danger. People that are just trying to live happy lives. I don't know what drove these villains to do this, but right now that doesn't matter. Flipping his chin strap together, he looked at Sunotori with determined eyes. Let's be heroes by saving people and winning. Sunotori stared at her fellow American with big, fascinated eyes. Wow, he's really taking this seriously. Aye, she clenched her fists and adopted a determined look. I have to do the same, even if it's just training. Right, she grinned and extended her fist. I got your back, Izuku. Smiling, he nodded and returned the fist bump. And I'll have yours. Team I you are free to enter the building. Your time starts now. All Might's voice came through the speakers. Stay safe, Izuku. Sunotori nodded to him as her horns disconnected from her head. Jumping on top of them, she flew around the building towards the fifth floor to start checking for the weapon. Taking a deep breath and exhaling, Midoriya entered the office building and headed for the stairway. He didn't waste time checking the first floor, knowing the bomb most likely wouldn't be there anyway. He pulled the shield off his back and slipped his left arm through the straps before quietly proceeding up the stairs. Reaching the second floor, he swiftly checked each room he passed, keeping the bomb's description and size in mind. The super soldier kept his head on a swivel and his ears open, staying on high alert. So far it was quiet. Izuku, fifth floor is all clear. Sunotori's voice informed him through the earpiece. I'm going to the fourth floor now. He tapped the earbud. Copy that. Second floor check is still in progress. Gotcha. As Midoriya approached a corner, he suddenly stopped when he heard the sounds of footsteps. Bakugo suddenly launched himself around the corner with a snarl, a few meters in the air. There you are. He roared and came down with an explosion in hand. Already anticipating the attack, Midoriya jumped and rolled out of the way as the ash blonde blasted the wall next to where he had been standing. The Verdette immediately stood back up in a boxer-based stance, his shield at the ready. His outfit was made of blacks and greens. With a hint of orange, it was mostly simple and sturdy, with two notable exceptions. The first was the mask on his face, which wrapped around his head and ended in what looked like tiny explosions. The second were the two massive gauntlets on his forearms that looked like oversized hand grenades. Nice dodge. Bakugo turned to face him, grinning fairly, but I won't miss again. Hands in the air and come quietly, villain. I don't want to hurt you, but I will if I have to, Midoriya stated, falling into character. Bakugo rolled his eyes and scoffed, like you could ever hurt me. Now, die. Guess he's playing the role too. Or this is just who he is, Midoriya sardonically thought. Bakugo launched himself at Midoriya with his right arm cocked back, the super soldier's green eyes closely following his movement. At the right moment, he stepped into Bakugo's guard to block his attack and promptly delivered a sharp right elbow to his face, knocking his head to the side and dazing him. Midoriya then grabbed Bakugo's outstretched arm and ducked under it, maneuvering behind him to deliver a strong left kick into the back of his opponent's head. Sharp pain shot throughout Bakugo's head from not just the kick, but from his face being slammed into concrete. The hell was that move? He left himself so wide open. Midoriya mused. Does he not know how to fight properly? Or was he just overconfident? Pony, Bakugo found me. He informed his partner. I'm currently engaging him. Okay, I'm still checking the fourth floor. Do you need help? She sounded concerned. 
Negative. Keep searching for the bomb. I can handle this. Okay, got it. I'll let you know when I find the bomb. Copy that. He watched Bakugo pick himself off the floor, still grimacing, bruises were noticeable on his face. Last warning, villain, surrender, or I'll be forced to take you down hard, Midoriya sternly said. Bakugo turned to him, growling angrily as blood trickled from his nose. Don't look down on me, stealth Gaijin. He blasted himself forward and twisted his body to deliver a powerful left kick aimed at Midoriya's head, which he immediately ducked under. He started with a kick this time, Midoriya internally noted. He's changing things up, huh? While still in midair, Bakugo turned himself around to extend both hands at his opponent and unleashed an explosion. Midoriya brought up his shield in time to successfully block it, his ears ringing from the loud blast. He narrowed his eyes as the smoke temporarily clouded his vision. The floor around him was scorched and cracked, but the shield in his uniform protected him from the brunt of the explosion. You think you're better than me? Bakugo's sneer was visible as the smoke dissipated. He shot forward again to deliver a glowing right hook. Midoriya held up the shield to block the attack until, at the last moment, Bakugo suddenly aimed his hand down to fire an explosion to send him flying over Midori. Bakugo turned in midair to release a blast from his left palm at Midoriya's right side. The verdette was knocked off his feet before he tumbled down the hallway. You're not. Nowhere close. Bakugo furiously exclaimed. I'm the strongest one here. Midoriya painfully groaned as he picked himself up. Though the suit protected him from the heat, he still felt the force behind the blast. Impressive feint. He even aimed for my right side where I couldn't easily block the attack. He thought, he's much smarter than he lets on. Still, that pride of his, I can use that against him. He resumed his stance leading with his left side where he could easily use the shield. TCH. Bakugo clicked his tongue and spat, Ya know only weaklings bring shields into battle. He crouched low, his arms curled and ready to unleash more explosions. Midoriya raised a brow. Think so. He suddenly spun around to throw the shield vertically with impressive force. Bakugo was too slow to dodge as the indestructible disc slammed into his chest. The force behind the hit sent Bakugo careening back and crashing through a corner. Meanwhile, the shield bounced off the ceiling and back to Midoriya's waiting grasp. The ash blonde coughed up a little blood and could have sworn he heard a sickening crack when the shield hit his stern. SHT. He shouted out in pain. Are you sure you want to continue? Midoriya placed the shield back on his left arm. Give up and we'll get you immediate medical attention, villain. Bakugo snarled savagely. How dare he look down on him? Did this fumbling moron really think he was superior to him? The memory of Midoriya pulling him out of the sludge villain and standing in front of him suddenly flashed through his mind, causing to clench his teeth together. Are you seriously taking pity on me? Don't you dare pity me. Fighting through the searing pain filling his chest, he pulled himself out of the wall and rushed forward. Hard way it is then. Midoriya reacted immediately by dashing forward in a burst of speed that Bakugo wasn't expecting. The explosion user suddenly felt a sharp crunch in his face as Midoriya swung the edge of the shield at him, breaking Bakugo's jaw and sending blood flying out of his mouth. With his opponent stunned, Midoriya immediately followed up with hard right and left gut punches before finishing with a devastating right uppercut that sent Bakugo crashing through another nearby wall. The explosive blonde didn't get back up after that. Midoriya rushed over to Bakugo's position, ready for a surprise counterattack. He eased up when he saw that the blonde was completely knocked out. The veteran couldn't help but flinch when he noticed the red swollen bruises on Bakugo's face and the blood leaking out from his mouth and nose. Probably should have held back a little more. He internally chided. Thank God this school has recovery girl on staff. I warned you, villain, he said, still playing his role. I'll make sure you receive the best care, though. Not just for your hospital stay, but also that you can maybe rejoin society one day. Midoriya pulled out the capture tape roll from his belt and wrapped it around his opponent's leg, eliminating him from the match. Bakugo Katsuki has been captured. All Might called over the radios. Midoriya looked around and spotted one of the cameras on the ceiling. Knowing Yagi couldn't hear him, he waved at it and then pointed at Bakugo. Don't worry, young Midoriya. All Might understood the message. I'll send one of the med bots to pick up Bakugo and take him to Recovery Girl. Please, continue with the exercise. Midoriya nodded, moving around the corner and toward the stairs. If Bakugo was willing to fight here then that meant the weapon wasn't on the second floor at all. He reached the third floor as Tsunotori contacted him over the radio. Izuku, I found the weapon, it's on the fourth floor, fifth room from the stairwell. Also, great job on taking down Bakugo. Copy that. Can you get to the weapon? He inquired, continuing up the stairs to the fourth floor. I think so, but it'd be easier with a distraction. Tsunotori replied. Midoriya grinned slyly. I can be distracting. Reaching the fourth floor and going down the corridor, he spotted the fifth door that Tsunotori had informed him about. All right, here's what we'll do. The observation room was silent as everyone watched the monitors with various levels of shock after Midoriya took down Bakugo. Holy crap. Sato breathed out. 
That was insane. Did you see how he conned back Hugo? Kirishima shouted excitedly. That was so freaking manly. Those moves were so cool. Ashido joined in. Wow, he freaking owned him. Kaminari grinned. Midoriya Sen ended the fight in barely a minute. He certainly didn't waste time. Takoyami subduedly remarked. Heroes should always be trying to avoid a prolonged battle with villains if it can be helped, especially in a timed scenario such as this. If you can end the fight quickly, you should do so. All Might sagely stated. Keep in mind, though, you should never be actively trying to kill your opponent. We are heroes, after all. Understand, students. Yes sir. Todoroki's eyes narrowed at the screen displaying Midori. Midoriya. The way he fights, the way he moves. He's been trained. Hiroraka and Yeyurazu were speechless as they watched the screens in amazement at how quickly and efficiently Midoriya had defeated Bakugo. They both knew he was a skilled fighter but seeing how he had tossed his shield at Bakugo and easily caught it gave them the same vibes when they watched old videos and movies of their favorite old pro hero. That was so cool. Yuraraka internally squealed. Wow, I'd love to be able to fight like that someday. Yeyurazu eyed the footage of Midoriya keenly. That shield. The way it bounced off Bakugo in the wall. It operates just like the captain's shield. Is this what Midori-kun wanted to surprise us with? Still, where could he have gotten a support item like that? The door was smashed clean off its hinges as Midoriya rushed into the room with his shield out in front. Ada, who had been standing near the faux bomb, immediately focused on the green-clad super soldier. Ada's hero costume looked like a cross between a robot and a medieval knight. The white plates were sleek but sturdy, as was the black mesh between the plates. The boosters popping out of his legs, and his general attitude, gave even more credence to the robot warrior look. You've done well, hero. Ada held his arms out to his sides and laughed as maniacally as he could. But you will not be stopping my nefarious plans today. Midoriya maintained a straight face, although it was hard for him at that moment. Ada was many things, but a good actor wasn't one of them. You're right, I won't, Midoriya agreed, and even with Ida's helmet on he could see the confusion on his face. Come again, Ida asked, confused. She is. Ada suddenly felt something hit him from behind in both knees and shoulders, slamming him face first into the concrete floor. What just? He turned his head to see lyre-shaped horns pinning him to the floor by his shoulders and could feel two more around his knees. His eyes widened in realization. Sunotori san present. The blonde girl jumped down from a nearby window to touch the bomb. She'd only had to open the window while Ada was distracted to complete her part of the plan. Weapon secured. No, the weapon. Ada cried out in shocked despair at his inability to protect the mock weapon. The bomb has been disabled. All Might shouted. The hero team. Wins. As soon as the buzzer went off, Sunotori remotely removed the horns that were pinning Ada down, allowing him to return to his feet. Great plan, Izuku. Sunotori smiled at her partner. Thanks, you did good yourself, Pony. Midoriya smiled, letting himself ease up now that the mission had been accomplished. He unclipped his helmet before fastening it to a loop on his belt. Good job, Ida. If Bakugo had been more cooperative, I'm sure you both would have done better. Thank you, Midoriya, but I'm not so sure. Ada replied as the trio walked out of the room towards the stairwell. Your plan was smart and made use of both of your quirks. Well done, Midoriya and Tsunotori accepted the stiff teen's praise as they walked down the stairway together. Later, after both teams rejoined their classmates in the observation room, Sans Bakugo, who was rushed to recovery girl's office the class turned to collectively stare at Midoriya and Tsunotori. Well then, now that that's all settled, let's discuss what happened. All Might declared. Any questions or comments for Team I? Takage held up her hand. You both split up to search the building, but you didn't really check the first floor, Midoriya. Why is that? Well, I suspected that neither Bakugo-sen nor Ada would put the bomb on the first floor, so I didn't want to waste time searching there. Midoriya answered. But Tsunotori was checking the building from top to bottom, so, if I was off in my assessment, she would have located it with time to spare given her speed while she's flying. Takage nodded in understanding. Yeyurazu raised her hand. Were you expecting Bakugo-sen to come for you? Midoriya nodded. I was. Let's just say. I had a strong hunch he would. Hiroshima spoke up. Speaking of Bakugo, that finishing move you used against him was killer, if a bit brutal. Basui followed up. Yeah, Midoriya rubbed his neck awkwardly. I should have held back a little bit more. Got too into my role, I suppose. Todoroki surprisingly raised his hand and asked point blank, who trained you? It's obvious you've received training based on the way you move and fight. That observation caught most of the class's attention as they turned to Midoriya curiously. Todoroki had brought up a good point, after all. All Might knew Midoriya already had his cover story, but hearing Todoroki go straight for the jugular, so to speak, made him feel mildly anxious. He was thankful that the room's dim lighting helped conceal his uneasy expression. Be careful in how you respond, Captain. One wrong move in the U.S. Army, Midoriya simply replied, or you could just tell them that. All Might's sweat dropped. 
The class, Sans Yuraka and Yeyurazu, looked at him with mixed levels of surprise. Wait, seriously? Kaminari's eyes widened like plates. You're a soldier. Shoji was equally surprised. Midoriya chuckled bashfully. Yeah, I learned quite a lot during my time of service in America. I wanted to take what I learned and apply it to becoming a pro hero. That wasn't untrue. That's so manly. Hiroshima walked up to pat Midoriya on the back. We have an actual soldier in our class. A soldier boy. Ashido smiled cheekily. It's not a big deal. Really, Midoriya scratched his cheek from the sudden attention. All Might laughed. Being humble is a good heroic trait to have. Overall, I'd say Team I performed admirably with their strategy, cooperation, and use of quirks. All Might stated. Now, any questions or comments for Ada over Team J's performance? Shoji raised a hand. Why were you guarding the bomb, Ada-san? Since you're the faster one, wouldn't it have made more sense for Bakugo-san to guard it while you search for the heroes? Ida exhaled deeply and slumped his shoulders. Bakugo-san was determined to find and beat Midoriya on his own. He refused to cooperate, and I was left to guard the weapon. Takage then spoke up. I believe it's obvious then that Bakugo-san's decision to go after Midoriya cost the villain team the match. Had he remained with Ida-san to guard the weapon or even sent Ida to face the hero team, as Shoji-san suggested, they would have stood a better chance. Instead, Bakugo-san was beaten and that left Ida-san to fight a two-on-one battle. Not smart. Kaminari lifted his hand. Yeah, also, couldn't Bakugo-san have blasted up the entrances? Even if he had done that on his way to face Midoriya-san alone, that would have slowed Midoriya-san down a bit. Hiro and Ida-san could have just picked up the bomb and ran around with it, Asui noted before she tapped her cheek with her gloved hand. Come to think of it, none of the villain teams did that, and there was no rule saying they couldn't. Thanks to the darkness, there was no way to see the nervous sweat on All Might's brow. If there was, it would have been obvious that he had never considered that option either. Yes, well, those are all very good points. All Might acknowledged. Moving on, who can tell me the MVP of this match? Sir, I can tell you. Yeyarazu raised her hand once more. The MVP was Midoriya. He quickly determined his opponent's actions and created a plan to take advantage of them. He made excellent use of not only his own quirk but his partner's as well. Instead of engaging Bakugo-san in a long drawn-out fight, like Bakugo-san wanted him to, he subdued him quickly and moved to assist his teammate to complete their objective. Correct. Excellent analysis, young Yeyurazu. All Might smiled. Yeyurazu, in response, bowed slightly with her arms at her side. Midori-kun, that was amazing. Yuraraka beamed as she bounced over to him, Midoriya doing his best to look away from her chest area. You and Tsunotori both did great. Thanks, Yuraraka-san. Tsunotori smiled. Izuku came up with a great plan. He was totally in the zone during the match. You give me too much credit. I just had a strong suspicion for how Bakugo would react. That's all. Midoriya waved off the praise, flustered by two admittedly pretty girls complimenting him. Good work today, all of you. All Might congratulated. Your final scores will be ready outside in a moment. Please, take them and then head to the locker room to change, and you're free to go. Anyone else who feels like their injuries may hamper them are also encouraged to see Recovery Girl. Dismissed. Yes sir. Everyone responded. The students filed out of the room and left All Might alone. He then reverted back to his skinny form in a puff of smoke. These kids, he murmured as he began typing grades into a computer, they almost gave me a heart attack a few times. Was I that reckless when I was that age? Fort Erskine, Con July 2042. Evening had arrived and the SSR recruits had finally finished their last drill for the day, an obstacle course that involved military crawling under barbed wire and through concrete drainage tunnels. All right, line up. Get in formation. Corporal Yamamoto ordered. The 13 recruits complied. Most were out of breath and very sweaty. Good work today. I mean it. The Ravenet acknowledged. Cadet Midoriya and Private Barnes. Yes ma'am. Both responded. Both of you remain here. She looked at the rest of the group. Everyone else can head to the dining facility. Dismissed. Yes ma'am. The recruits, Sans Bucky and Izuku, left in an orderly fashion in the direction of the main facility. Yamamoto turned back to the pair. Although they maintained neutral faces, she could see the emotion in their eyes. Bucky was curious while Izuku was disappointed. I'm sorry, Izukun, but I'm doing this because I care. Peggy tried to convince herself, but still felt terrible deep down. Private Barnes, she addressed the Brunet. Yes ma'am, this morning, I told Cadet Midoriya that he needed to win one round of pugil sticks. If he failed, then not only would he be punished, but you, as his battle buddy, would be as well. Corporal Yamamoto informed him. Do you understand? Bucky didn't respond immediately. Why? Yes ma'am. Izuku couldn't suppress a frown. Both of you will do three sets of ten military push-ups, sit-ups, squats, and burpees. After that, you'll do one full lap around the flagpole trail. She motioned to the dirt trail that cut into the woods. Is that understood? Yes ma'am. Both acknowledged her orders. Then get to it. 
The sooner you finish, the sooner you can eat, she ordered. Over half an hour later, Izuku and Bucky were finally on the last exercise of their punishment, running down the trail back to the main gate where Corporal Yamamoto was waiting for them. Keep it up. Almost done, man, Bucky said in between breaths. Izuku couldn't respond as he focused on sucking in air, his body burning from exhaustion. One more push. Finish line is up ahead. Bucky pointed ahead. Izuku wordlessly nodded and, despite his body screaming for him to stop, he pressed on with Bucky running alongside him. Moments later, the pair finally crossed the gate and immediately stopped. Bucky leaned over to rest his hands on his knees while Izuku simply fell to his hands and knees, panting heavily. Corporal Yamamoto walked up to them with her hands behind her back, her expression neutral. Taking note of the pair's exhausted states, she nodded. There's still ten minutes left for dinner time. If you head to the dining hall now, you can still get something to eat before they stop serving. You're dismissed. Yes ma'am, Bucky subduedly replied. Peggy glanced down at Izuku on the ground. Cadet Midoriya. Why yes dot 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 ma'am. Izuku breathed out, giving a shaky salute. The ravenette nodded and sauntered away, leaving the pair alone. Bucky kneeled by Izuku's side, resting a hand on his left shoulder. Need a medic, or a new set of lungs? He jokingly asked though he was concerned that Izuku may possibly need medical attention. I'm fine, he panted and coughed. Just need a minute. Well, we don't want to miss dinner, so let me help you out. Bucky helped Izuku stand, placing his left arm over his shoulder to let him lean against him. The pair steadily continued in the general direction of the dining hall. I think we're both gonna sleep soundly tonight, my man. He chuckled to himself. So we may need to hold off on your pugil stick lessons till... He paused as Izuku began to suddenly cry. Hey, what's wrong? He worriedly asked. Was he hurt? Did he push himself too far? I'm sorry. It's my fault. Bucky cocked a brow, confused. What are you? I lost all three rounds. It's because of me you had to be punished too. He sniffled. Oh, so that's what's bothering him. Bucky smiled and squeezed the shorter teen's shoulder. Relax, man. I'm not mad at you. But, but nothing. He cut in. You did good, all things considered. More importantly, you never gave up. No matter how many times you got knocked down, you kept getting back up like a real soldier. I respect the hell out of that. I still lost though. And you have to be punished with me too. Izuku weakly mentioned. Maybe if you hadn't been my battle buddy you, I'm gonna stop you right there. Bucky interjected. Don't you dare go down that self-pity road. Izuku. Seriously, believe me when I say that you did nothing wrong. Izuku wasn't entirely convinced as he looked away. After years of being either ignored or bullied by his peers, primarily Zack, it was difficult not to have a self-deprecating mindset at times. Bucky momentarily paused to run his hand through his short brown hair and sighed. Look, I'm not good with all this emotional stuff. I've made a lot of dumb mistakes in my life, but choosing you as my friend isn't one of them. The scrawny kid looked up at the taller, muscular teen with wide brown eyes, his mouth slightly agape. Did he really mean that? Bucky grinned earnestly. So please, get off the pity pot. Will ya? Izuku couldn't suppress a few sobs, a smile taking shape on his face for the first time today. Okay, thank you, Bucky. Bucky chuckled lightheartedly and shook his head. You need to work on that crying of yours, man. I get that real men aren't afraid to show their emotions and all, but you need a tighter lid on it while you're in uniform. Izuku nodded in understanding. So this is what it's like, to have a guy as a real friend. He mused wistfully. If Zack hadn't developed a meta ability, would we have been good friends? The Japanese-American briefly pondered that thought and came to an easy conclusion. No, not a real friend anyways. Besides, Bucky went on as they approached the dining hall. You were at a huge disadvantage in those pugil matches anyway. Everyone in the program aside from you has completed basic training, so pugil matches are nothing new to us. To expect you to win once against James or Sharon, who are both ruthless, I might add, isn't realistic. And the corporal knew that. Izuku turned to Bucky somewhat surprised. Wait, you mean, Peg Chan knew I'd lose. Bucky rolled his eyes. Obviously. What, you haven't figured it out yet? Figured out what? He questioned, confused. The Brunnet groaned and used his free arm to pinch the bridge of his nose. How could someone so smart? Ugh, she's trying to make you quit, dude. Izuku's eyes briefly widened before he lowered his head, frowning. You already knew, didn't you? Bucky read his friend's expression. Izuku nodded, downcast. Bye. I wanted to believe Peg Chan was just trying to motivate me harder since I'm so far behind everyone else. But after today, I can't ignore it anymore. Really P.S. says me off. Bucky growled, furrowing his brows. She's supposed to be your friend, right? She should have your back more than anyone else here. Yeah, but I can't be too mad with her. She's my friend. And even though she is trying to get me to quit, I know she's only doing it because she cares. Izuku advocated. Running you into the dirt and punishing those who try to help you is her way of showing that. Bucky retorted. You made your choice. Corporal should respect it whether she likes it or not. 
Izuku knew Bucky was right but couldn't bring himself to verbally agree. As the pair approached the dining hall's main doors, Bucky allowed Izuku to stand on his own. We have nine more weeks of this training camp from hell. Just so you know, I got your back no matter what. He jerked his thumb toward the door. And the others are rooting for you too. So even if Peg Chan doesn't support you, we do, my brother. Izuku smiled at that statement. He understood his mother and Peggy's objections to him joining the military. But it was honestly quite refreshing to be around people who actually supported his dream and wanted him to achieve it. Thank you, Buck. You're a great friend. He said sincerely. Bucky grinned. I want to see you become a full-fledged soldier too. If you can achieve that dream, he looked away wistfully. Then maybe one day I can achieve my dream too. Izuku looked at his friend curiously. Oh, what is your dream, Bucky? Yeah, I'll tell you some other time. Bucky laughed. First, let's go in already. I'm starving. With that, the kid from Fresno and the Brooklynite walked into the building. Meanwhile, around the corner, Corporal Yamamoto had been eavesdropping on the majority of the pair's conversation. Needless to say, she was quite distraught as she clenched her fists. No, of all places, Izuku had to make a true friend here. Damn it. She gritted her teeth in frustration. The marine woman was left feeling very conflicted. On one hand, it was a wholesome and touching sight to see Izuku making friends with people that liked and respected him. On the other, it completely foiled her plan on trying to make him quit before the 10-day deadline. With Izuku's steadfast convictions and the full support from the other SSR recruits, she had come to a terrifying realization. He's not going to give up. Her voice quivered. He'll keep going. Until he dies. There's only one more day left. I have to stop this now while I still can. She closed her eyes and breathed deeply to recompose herself. A short moment later, she reopened her gray eyes with a sharp, focused expression. She then proceeded in the direction of the science facility with swift, determined strides. There was a certain eccentric scientist she needed to have a talk with. Musutafu, Japan, April 2197. Midoriya walked out of the men's locker room with both his costume briefcase and the bag containing his shield in hand. Walking alongside him were Ada and Siro, all three having changed back into their UA Hero Department uniforms. You guys didn't have to wait for me, Midoriya told them. Although, I do appreciate it. It's not trouble at all, Midoriya. Ada adjusted his glasses. It's what friends do, after all. Midoriya smiled at that proclamation. Only the second day of school and Ida already considered them friends. That was nice. Yeah. Also, Siro frowned. I wanted to apologize to you. Huh? Midoriya looked at him, confused. Apologize for what? Well, Siro rubbed his neck uncomfortably. After your team left the room, we were making predictions on who'd win the match. I thought Bakugo and Ida's team would win pretty convincingly. I'm sorry for doubting you and all. Oh, you don't need to apologize. Midoriya waved it off, unfazed. Besides, I can see why you'd think that. I mean, if Beck Hugo-sen had worked together with Ida, Sunotori and I would have had our work cut out for us. So, we're cool. The tape user asked. Midoriya smiled and nodded. We're cool. Speaking of Beck Hugo-san, I never saw him return to the locker room. Ida pointed out. I wonder if we should check up on him in the medical ward. Midoriya shrugged. It couldn't hurt. We should return our equipment first. Ida nodded in agreement. Arriving at their foundational heroics classroom, Midoriya pulled the door open to see that they were not alone. Hiroraka, Yeyarazu, Ashido, Asui, Takage, and Tsunatori were grouped near the wall panels where their briefcases were stored. There you guys are. Ashido's smile dropped slightly when she noticed one less person with them. Hey, have you seen Kirishima-kun? He never came back to return his costume. I think Kirishima-san mentioned something about going to visit Bakugo-san in the medical ward. Make sure he was recovering well and all. Siro mentioned offhandedly. That's good. Maybe Bakugo will start to lighten up a little bit after today, Midoriya thought. Although, he was doubtful something like that would happen overnight. Ashido, meanwhile, sighed in exasperation as if she had been expecting that answer. Of course he is. Big Lug can't help but try to be friends with everyone. Well, I'm glad he's at least making an effort. Midoriya stepped to the adjacent wall. Although, that will be one tough nut to crack. No kidding. Iraraka remarked under her breath. By the way, Takage looked at the trio. What took you guys so long? Everyone else has already got dressed and put away their costume cases. That was because of me. Midoriya sheepishly replied, placing his shield bag and briefcase back into its compartment. Takes me longer than I'd like to fully suit up, and slightly more to undress, apparently. At the word undress, Yuraka couldn't stop the image of her friend removing his costume from popping up in her mind. She immediately looked away and started patting her reddening cheeks. Stop it. Stop it. Bad thoughts. Yeyarazu looked at Midoriya's face momentarily before her gaze drifted lower. She could only imagine what those clothes and his costume earlier were concealing. She then shook her head. My word. Control yourself, Momo. She chided herself, a small blush forming on her face. He's your friend. 
not some object for you to ogle. While everyone else remained oblivious to the two girls' embarrassment, a certain Pinkette had noticed and she couldn't help but grin mischievously. As a once hopeless romantic herself, she recognized those looks anywhere. Oh, this is gonna be so much fun. She inwardly cackled. Maybe you should talk to the support department about that and have them readjust it for you. Hiro, Asui suggested. Siro looked at the frog girl, cocking a brow. No offense meant. But do you end every sentence with a Kiro, Asui-san? Not every sentence. Asui replied. And please, call me Tsuyu. All my friends call me that. Siro smiled widely, giving a thumb up. Sure thing. Hiro. Siro blinked twice. You did that one on purpose just now, didn't you? Asui looked away. Her face was blank yet portrayed feigned innocence at the same time, somehow. Maybe. Or maybe not. She shrugged. The group couldn't help but laugh at that reaction. Even Ada couldn't suppress a smile. After putting his equipment away, Midoriya walked to his desk to pick up his yellow satchel. Well, to answer your question, Asui-san, he said, I don't think I can go to the support department since a support company not affiliated with the school made my costume. I'll have to contact them later about it. Oh, once she composed herself, Yuraka looked at Midoriya curiously. You were able to contract a support company, Midori-kun. That must have been very expensive, right? Midoriya shook his head. A friend of mine works at a support company in America. When he found out I was attending UA, he was pretty insistent on making my costume free of charge. He sheepishly shrugged. I tried to say no, but I couldn't turn him down. That was half true. While S.H.I.E.L.D. wasn't exactly a heroic support company, Carlson was pretty insistent on S.H.I.E.L.D. making his hero costume. The adult fanboy had even drawn up a costume design for him. However, much to Midoriya's embarrassment, it was based too much on that dreaded stage suit he wore in those shows. Midoriya, while appreciative, had to gently turn down Carlson's suit idea. That was awfully generous of him. Ida commented, placing his briefcase back in its slot. No kidding. Takage chimed in. Wish my family had connections like that. Could have saved a lot of money on getting my costume made. Yay Arazu looked in Takage's direction. Takage, would you mind if I ask you later what support company your family contracted? Sure, Takage shrugged nonchalantly. Don't see why not. Seriously, how many people in our class were able to hire support companies to make their costumes? Siro remarked as he put his briefcase away. Hiro, I think it was just Takage, Yamomo, and now Midoriya. Asui replied, and then touched her chin thoughtfully. Well, maybe Todoroki-san, but I don't think he'd care to tell us. That dude does seem pretty cold. Takage commented. No pun intended. Siro would know firsthand how cold Todoroki is, Kiro. Basui mentioned. Yeah, Siro's sweat dropped, recalling his lackluster match against the icy powerhouse. Real cold. You guys talking about Todoroki-san. The group turned to see Kirishima standing at the door in his uniform with his briefcase in hand. Not my best moment. He laughed awkwardly while rubbing his neck. I didn't even get a chance to show my stuff. You're blocking the door, shtty hair. Akugo walked up behind the redhead dressed in his uniform with his usual scowl etched on his face. Though he had bandages on his face and gauze wrapped around his head, he looked much better than he did after the match. Recovery girl's healing quirk truly was remarkable, Midoriya thought. Oh, sorry, man. Kirishima stepped aside, letting the explosive blonde walk in to put away his costume briefcase as the tension in the room kept rising. Akugo-sen's gonna be okay, by the way. Kirishima continued. Recovery girl was able to heal his face and everything, although her quirk drained his stamina, so he was out cold for a little while. Ah, Ida nodded in satisfaction. Well that's good to hear you're doing better, Bakugo-san. Shut up, four eyes. The blonde rolled his eyes, gathering his belongings at his desk. So rude. Ida shouted, appalled. We were partners, you know. Bakugo merely huffed as he walked away, slinging his bag over his shoulder. Hey, Bakugo-san, Midoriya called out, walking up to him. Bakugo stopped at the doorway but didn't turn around. Look, I think we may have gotten off on the wrong foot or something. I'm new here and there's a lot that I'm still learning. Midoriya rubbed his neck awkwardly. I don't want us to be enemies, but if you don't want to be friends that's fine too. Can we at least be tolerant of each other going forward this semester? No need for strife, right? Bakugo remained still and didn't respond. Everyone watched the scene with bated breath, curious to see how it played out. Midoriya, Bakugo finally said. Midoriya's eyes widened slightly. He called me by name. Yeah. Bakugo turned his head and shot him a bored glare. FKU. With that said, the ash blonde stomped away down the corridor in silence with a pensive expression. So that guy's a soldier, huh? After waking up in the medical ward, SHTTY hair was there to give him a rundown of what happened after he lost unconscious, sporting that dumb, friendly grin of his all the while. Bakugo could hardly believe he had been beaten so easily. Him, the one born with an amazing quirk and destined to become the next number one hero just as he had been told by everyone growing up. 
But all that stealth Gaijin had to do was hit him a few times and that was it. Lights out. Was he really that far behind the stealth Gaijin? To make matters worse, the ice guy, after seeing how he had single-handedly won his match, Bakugo had realized there was no way he could beat him in a straight fight. There were now two people ahead of him in the class, not counting those cheaters ponytail and round face. It was unacceptable. Just as he was on the verge of a panic attack, in the midst of SHTTY hairs babbling, he had offhandedly mentioned that Stealth Gaijin was in the American military. Bakugo paused when he had heard this information, and that's when it all clicked. Midoriya Izuku. He wasn't at some unobtainable level. Despite being a flustered and bumbling mess, he was still a trained professional in the right circumstances. That fact had been made abundantly clear in the exercise today. Bakugo clicked his tongue and rubbed his jaw, which had been fully healed but was still aching. His chest also hurt from where that shield had struck him. Damn, that it hurt like hell. The explosion user realized all he needed was more training and experience to add on to it. Then he would overtake him. He'd pass that ice bastard along the way too. They would both be mere stepping stones in his ascension to greatness. He'd write about it in a book one day, and, or talk about it in a documentary, covering his rise to becoming Japan's newest and disputed number one hero. But until that day, enjoy that win today. Midoriya, Bakugo sneered, clenching his right fist in determination. He won't get another. I'm just getting started. Meanwhile, the classroom had been left in silence after Bakugo's exit until Ida finally broke it. H how rude. He was aghast. How could he be so uncouth after Midoriya extended an olive branch? So vulgar. Ye Arazu placed a hand over her mouth in disgust. To CH, Yuraka clenched her fists angrily, glaring at the doorway where Bakugo stood moments prior. A hole, she murmured, though he did refer to Midori Kun by his name instead of that stupid nickname. Maybe that's progress. Can't say I didn't see that one coming. Takage rolled her eyes. Ashido looked at Kirishima with half-lidded, bored eyes. Still think you can be friends with him, babe? Well, Hiroshima chuckled awkwardly. At least he called Midoriya-san by his name. That's something, right? Midoriya turned to the spiky redhead with a sheepish half-smile. Yeah, I guess it is. He sweat dropped. Sunotori sighed heavily. Bakugo-san just seems like a bully. I don't get why Yue allowed him here. Asui and Siro nodded in agreement. Well, like most things in life, Midoriya turned to the group. It's not always so black and white. There's plenty of gray areas. Right, Hiroshima added, grinning. Sure, Bakugo-sen may seem like a jerk, that's because he is. Hiroraka cut in. See that he is, Kirishima admitted and continued. But I think there might be more to him than that, y'all know. Midoriya shrugged. Like Optimus Prime once said, there's more than meets the eye. He said absent-mindedly. The group looked at him in bemusement. Two, Takage asked. Midoriya's expression faltered, realizing he had slipped up. Uh, he's just a cartoon character, from a show in America. I used to watch it when I was younger. Huh, Sunotori tilted her head. I don't think I've heard of him. Izuku, what show is he in? Just some old show. It's not important. Midoriya waved him off before he glanced at his watch. We should probably get going now. It's already past 18.30. Ida nodded in agreement. Yes, for those who use trains, we don't want to miss ours. The group gathered their belongings and exited the room. By the way, Midoriya-san, Asui walked up to her fellow Verdet. Would you like to exchange numbers? I got the others while we were waiting in the classroom for you guys. Same, Siro popped in. I didn't get a chance to get yours yesterday. If that's cool, I mean. Midoriya was flustered from the sudden requests. Why yeah, sure. That sounds great. He pulled out his phone and handed it to them. By the way, you can call me Tsuyu. Asui said as she entered her contact information. All my friends call me that. And you can just drop the honorifics with me. Siro smiled laxly. And then entered his info after Asui handed him the phone. Maybe you can teach me some of those sweet moves of yours sometime soon. Midoriya nodded excitedly. Yeah, it'd be my pleasure. Later, most of the group gave their farewells and headed for their respective stations, while Midoriya, Yuraka, and Yeyorazu remained near the campus's main gate. Yeyorazu's black limousine had just arrived, and she was preparing to get in until she remembered her request from earlier in the morning. By the way, the heiress looked at her two best friends, I was wondering. If neither of you are busy this way, perhaps we could have a get-together at my place. It occurred to me recently that you've never been to my house. She lowered her head in shame. Even though we've been friends for a while now. Don't be upset, Yamomo. Yoraka patted her shoulder reassuringly as she beamed brightly. And yeah, I'd love to come over. I've been wondering what your house looks like. Midori-kun. She looked at the Verdad excitedly. Midoriya smiled and nodded. Absolutely. I'd love to come over. It's been long overdue, honestly. Yeyarazu smiled brightly at their acceptance. All right. I'll talk with the staff and have them set aside some rooms for us. There'll be plenty of tea and food. Staff. How rich is she? Both the super soldier and gravity girl thought. She opened the limo door and stepped inside. I'll send you my home address soon. 
Until then, good night. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye yeah Momo. Midoriya and Yuraka waved goodbye to their heiress friend as she drove off in the limo. This is perfect. Yeah Yurazu thought happily. We'll get to hang out like best friends do in all of the novels I've read. Also, her thoughts drifted to a certain verdette. Maybe I can get a chance to ask Midori-kun some questions too. Meanwhile, Yuraka and Midoriya began walking down the sidewalk to the nearest station. Yamomo is adorable sometimes, isn't she? Yuraka smiled. Midoriya nodded. Yeah, she is. He then sported a thoughtful visage. But, I can understand where she's coming from. Me and you are likely the first real friends she's ever had not related to her family or people who work for them. Of course she's excited. He pulled out his phone and looked at his growing contact list wistfully. After his blunder in the practical exams orientation, he had been concerned that he'd have a hard time making friends. He was grateful that wasn't the case. Yuraka glanced at Midoriya's phone before she looked at him fondly. For someone who says they barely had any friends growing up, you sure are good at making them, Midori-kun. Midoriya blushed lightly. You think so? Yuraka nodded. I know so. Now come on. She gently pulled the taller boy's arm. Let's go home already. We have math homework that I may or may not need help on. Ha <laughs> ha. She chuckled bashfully. Midoriya smiled and rolled his eyes. Yeah, I get the hint. I'll help you. Thank you, Midori-kun. She placed her hands together, careful not to accidentally activate her quirk. Not a problem, Yuraka chan Really, the pair continued towards the station. I'm making so many friends. More than I ever thought I could. Maybe, maybe I can find my place in this time period. He mused.